Good evening, everyone. We're going to get started here. First, let me welcome everybody to the Gorton Community Center. My name is Bob Kiley. I'm the city manager here in Lake Forest, and I'm going to be the moderator this evening for this joint meeting of the HPC and Park and Rec Board. First, let me thank our host, Gorton Community Center, for allowing us to have the meeting here. And I would be remiss, and Brenda Dick would get really mad at me if I didn't encourage everybody to take literature when you leave about upcoming programs at Gorton. That's the uh, paid political announcement <laughs> here for this evening. Uh, I would like to mention that uh, Ed Johnson is in the back. He is taping tonight's meeting. It is going live over Channel 17. It will be posted on YouTube and also will be replayed on Channel 17 uh, at prescribed dates and times. And you can check, I think, the city's website to get the exact dates and times. Let's begin by having a roll call of our two boards. Mary Van Arsdale, will you take the role of the Parks and Recreation Board, please? Chairman Ford? Here. Chairman, or uh, Member Green? Member Hill? Member Shappy? Here. Ta Member Taylor? Here. Member Torelli? Here. Member Volkman? We have four four members for a quorum. Thank you. Kathy, can you please take the role of the HPC? Commissioner Preschlack? Not yet. Oh, you have yet. <laughs> I thought you said chair, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I can start at the other end. <laughs> you can start with chair if you want. <laughs> Commissioner Athenson? Here. Commissioner Swenson? Here. Chairman Peretz? Here. Commissioner Berg? Here. And Commissioner Ransom? Here. We have seven members present, uh, a quorum, and a full representation of the commission. Can I ask uh, Chairman Peretz to make some opening comments related to the continuation of the public hearing of the HPC? Sure. Uh, all members of the commission have been uh, present at other meetings, and all have already expressed uh, that there is no ex parte conflict on this matter. Okay. Nobody can hear. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, this is for the record that we have no ex parte conflicts on this matter. We've all uh, been prop party to this uh, proceeding already and have already declared that there's no conflicts. Thank you very much. Thanks. Let me also take this time to introduce city staff who is here. Director of Community Development, Kathy Cerniak. Director of Parks, Recreation, and Forestry, Mary Van Arsdale. I think I saw Michael Thomas, uh, Director of Public Works, is here. Uh, who else do I see back there? Chuck Myers, uh, Superintendent of Parks and Forestry. Sally Swarthout, I think, is back there as well. Uh, another Superintendent of Parks. And do, have I missed any of the staff? And also joining us here at some point in time when he's able to get out of the city of Chicago will be the city attorney, Vic Filippini. Who? On cue. Right on cue. How is that? Uh, Vic, there's a seat up front for you. Um, let me now ask. Um, for a introduction of the Forest Park Project Board. Ralph, would you please do that? Yes, I'm Ralph Giswaldo, president of the Forest Park Project Board. Our co-vice presidents are not here tonight. Unfortunately, they had vacations planned some time ago, Joe McQuay and Jane O'Neill. Peter Cherry, our treasurer, is also not here tonight with a previous engagement. Pam Bailey is here. I'd like you to just recognize yourself. Pam Bailey is here, our secretary. Mark Goodman, our legal counsel. Uh, Michael Ebner, historic preservation chair. Gail Hodges, at-large member of our executive board. Paul Bergman, an at-large member of our executive board. Cliff Miller, landscape and horticulture chair. Uh, Tom Swarthout, engineering and technical co-chair, along with Steve Douglas, also a co-chair of that committee. Judy Bogus, memorials and amenities chair. Drew Weidler, finance and fundraising chair. She does a great job. And Karen Stenthrude, our temporary public communications chair. I'd like to thank them for coming. Thank you, Ralph. Let's first review the goals and objectives this evening, and our goal really is fairly straightforward. First, we will ask the petitioners to uh, present a uh, overview of the changes and refinements to the plan that have been requested by the two boards and or city staff since the last public meetings. There will also be ample opportunity for articulation on both the functionality and design concepts that support this. Uh, plan and we've really tried to break them down into six major topic areas that uh, certainly city staff felt were issues that were raised at the two previous uh, or the two last public hearings before the Park and Rec Board and the HPC. 
City staff will go over and review the review process and implement state implementation steps for going forward. And then finally, there will be opportunities for public comment. And I would ask that uh, when anybody came in, there was a sign-up sheet if you wanted to speak. Uh, I'm going to ask Tr oh, there's Trish. I'm going to ask Trish to, if you want to speak and you didn't sign in, to please raise your hand, and Trish will come and uh, get your name on the list. So thank you. Okay, uh, to make sure that tonight's meeting is as productive as possible, we do have a few ground rules. First, I know that there's been a lot of questions about are there going to be any votes taken this evening, and the answer is no. The meeting this evening is informational for both the HPC and the Park and Rec Board. There will be follow-up meetings, and I will go into the timeline in more detail later on, but there will be follow-up meetings where those two boards will take their respective votes at that time. This is, I want to emphasize, however, a continuation of the public hearing that has been taking place at the Park and Rec Board and at the HPC. And uh, at the end of uh, the meeting this evening, the uh, chairmen for the two respective boards will have the prerogative for closing public comment uh, pursuant to the public hearing. The meeting format is going to be simple and consistent with the way that we operate most of our city boards and commissions, and that is that after these introductory comments, that we will then present uh, or have the uh, petitioner present the plans, address those issues that have changed since last time, and then topic by topic, we will then have them answer any questions that the members of the HPC or the Park and Rec Board have with that specific subject area. We're going to try and deal with subject areas one at a time, try and answer all the questions, and then once all the questions are answered with that subject area, we will then move on to the next subject area. Once we have completed all the subject areas and the Park and Rec Board and the HPC members have had ample time to ask all their questions, then we will be opening it up to public comment. So I would appreciate everybody's patience while we go through the plan. As I said, uh, with respect to public comment, please sign up. There was also uh, information about limitations on public comment. Um, it's important. I know there's a lot of people here that want to speak. We are going to limit comments to three minutes. We do have a timer. If you have written comments, please submit those to us. We will make sure that they become part of the record that goes to the two public boards as well as eventually to the city council. Let me begin because over the past couple of years, I've heard an awful lot, I've read about an awful lot, and I've seen through the meetings an awful lot about how did we get here. And there's an awful lot of misinformation about how we got here. I want to emphasize for everybody that this process was initiated by city staff. Back in 2007, many of you might remember that the North Shore Sanitary District was reconstructing part of its facility at the south parking lot that caused a lot of disruption in terms of where the boaters were going to park and how we were going to deal with parking at the south uh, portion of the uh, Forest Park Beach. The city staff at that time in analyzing our options and so forth really took a critical view of Forest Park and quite frankly at that time realized that Forest Park had been neglected for many years. I stand before you this evening to tell you that we had absolutely no plan when someone came to us and said, I'd like to put a park bench in Forest Park. We had absolutely no plan when someone said, I want to put a memorial tree in Forest Park. We had actually no plan when we had to remove the south portion of the ring road because it was uh, sloughing off and causing erosion on the bluff down there. Those kinds of things were not taken into consideration. Quite frankly, we didn't even talk about O.C. Simons back in those days. And the staff felt, quite frankly, embarrassed that we had allowed the front door to a magnificent asset, our beach, to really go neglected. And I've heard more than one person on both sides of the argument here talk about benign neglect, and I think that's a, that's a nice, polite way of saying that, quite frankly, we did forget about this park. It was a forgotten park. This is one of the few, I think maybe the only park that we have in the city of Lake Forest that has no semblance of a plan whatsoever. So knowing that we needed to make improvements, knowing that we didn't feel that this park met the standards of the other parks in the city of Lake Forest or open spaces in the city of Lake Forest, we set about how do we address this issue. Well, you might remember that this in 2007 was right about the time 
that the markets were starting to turn and the recession was starting to hit. So we realized that we weren't going to have funding available to deal with these kinds of issues. So what we did was rather than to say, well, we'll live with it for another 10 years or so, we followed a long tradition in the city of Lake Forest, and that's a joining of public and private to get things done. This building is an excellent example of that. This building is owned by the city of Lake Forest, but it wouldn't have happened without the generosity of many residents and the hard work of many people, some of who are here this evening, to make this happen. This is a long tradition, and quite frankly, it's been a long tradition that we, the city, have shared with the Lake Forest Garden Club. So we, the city of Lake Forest, reached out to the Lake Forest Garden Club because we had had a model, Market Square 2000, that we said could be replicated in this situation. Now, the members of the Lake Forest Garden Club probably wish they had never taken my phone call in the first place, considering what they've been through the last five years. But the reality is, is that we sat down, and with all the best of intentions, they came forward to put together a plan to bring this piece of property up to standards that I think everybody in the city of Lake Forest feels are worthy of this choice piece of property. So I would like to say, on behalf of myself and the city, that we do thank the Garden Club members for all that they have done and what they have gone through, because I feel a certain obligation, because I'm the one that got you involved in this thing. And I will tell you that I will continue to ask for you to be involved in projects going forward, uh, because you have contributed so much to the community over the years. So thank you for that. Here is a quick timeline on what we have done. As I said, we started having discussions in 2007. In June of 2009 with the first visioning sessions. And over the course of the next three plus years have been a tremendous number of hours spent either at public meetings or preparing different plans and documents, whether it was a conceptual plan that was reviewed and approved by the City Council in May 2010, or the uh, presentation on the master plan that you will see here this evening. I think, uh, and the City staff talks about this a lot, that I know this process has been very confusing at times for people, very frustrating at times for people. And I know it's been extremely emotional at times for people on both sides of the issue. And I think what we have to keep in mind is that there are very few <coughs> projects in the city of Lake Forest that don't generate the kind of emotion and uh, interest that a forest park kind of project will, uh, will <coughs> generate. And I think uh, I saw Gail Hodges somewhere here. I mean, Gail knows, uh, oh, there she is right in the front. Uh, Gail could tell you a lot of stories about the public hearing process related to this building. Or Prue could tell you a lot of uh, the stories about when Market Square was before the Building Review Board and the City Council. This thing is not that unusual. I know it's frustrating for people. But the reality is residents in the city of Lake Forest care very deeply about their community. And I would rather have people show up at public meetings and to invest their time and energies to make sure that these plans are right. Because our experience is, and I think this is a good example here this evening, that the plan is better at the end than it was when it first started the process. And so the public hearing process is a success. And I would also say to our two boards that are here that thank you for persevering through all of this over a period of time. And, um, you know, I truly believe two heads are better than one, and at the end of the day, history will prove that out with the quality of the petition that we have here this evening. Let me pause here for a moment and also talk about the roles of the two boards, because I've also heard a lot of, well, why is the Park and Rec Board involved? And actually, we got a letter today by an outside group that said this should be just the HPC and not the Park and Rec Board. Or why is the HPC involved? Isn't this a park? So let me try and go through each of the roles. and so. Maybe it will help clarify why multiple boards in the city of Lake Forest are involved in this important project. The, under city ordinance, the Park and Recreation Board does serve as an advisory body to the city council with respect to the development operation, so forth, of all city-owned parks. And we need to keep in mind, first and foremost, this is a city-owned park. This piece of property falls under the jurisdiction of the Parks and Recreation Board. 
And so they are the appropriate body under city ordinance to look at form and function as to what's happening at Forest Park. With respect to the HPC, they actually have two roles here this evening, one by ordinance and one by directive of the city council. The city council, back when they adopted the conceptual plan in 2010, asked the HPC to serve in an advisory capacity on the master plan because they recognize the sensitivity of this plan in the historic district of the city of Lake Forest. They also, under the city code, have a responsibility with respect to the issuance of certificate of appropriateness. And with that, I'm going to pause for a moment because the city attorney can be much more eloquent on this subject than I can. So Vic, will you pick up from there, please? Uh, thank you, Bob. With respect to the different roles, as, as Bob noted, the master plan itself is, it, is not a, an action affecting the park. It's really a vision for moving forward with the park. As such, it's not something that falls within the direct purview of the Historic Preservation Commission, which is either concerned with the designation of a landmark or district or certificates of appropriateness. I'm sorry, certificates of um, appropriateness, yes. <laughs> I just want to make sure if Kathy was listening. Um, <laughs> certificates of appropriateness with respect to alterations of uh, landmark uh, structures and the like. So when we look at what's before us tonight, with the plan itself, it is not going to make an alteration by virtue of it being a plan. Nevertheless, that's something that the council had asked the HPC to be involved in because of the obvious historic and other uh, cultural aspects that this park has long meant to the city of Lake Forest. So under the HPC ordinance, one of the duties of the HPC itself is to make recommendations to other bodies of the city when so directed by the council. The council directed, the HPC now has that responsibility placed before it. So with respect to the plan itself and the plan elements, the HPC, much like the uh, Park and Rec Board, are making recommendations ultimately to the city council with respect to the plan. Now there are elements within the plan which are discrete and which do fall within the purview of the HPC for purposes of certificates of appropriateness. I should note that where that line is has some ambiguity in the ordinance. Um, for example, there are some roadway aspects of the, the plan, and historically the city has not brought roadways in front of the HPC. And the reason for that, in part, is that the HPC's certificate of appropriateness responsibilities um, within a historic district relates to zoning lots. That's what the, act, or that's what the ordinance says. And roads are not in zoning lots. L roads are, are located outside of zoning lots. Nevertheless, I think in this instance, both because there are integrated improvements that involve the roads and because of the special nature of what's before it, it's been determined by the city to have this go before the HPC for basically what I'll call the, the hardscape elements of this plan. The landscaping elements are not under the purview of the HPC for purposes of a certificate of, of, of appropriateness, but the hardscape programs are. As we look at it as a, as a whole, the, the plan will be getting input from both of the uh, bodies before us tonight, mm -hmm. both in terms of the overall approach and in terms of the landscaping and, and related concepts. And the HPC will have the special duty with respect to the hardscapes to make uh, determinations on certificates of appropriateness there. Now that ordinance has a series of steps that are required for certificates of appropriateness. Mm -hmm. It's old hat to the members of the HPC. But for those of you who are unacquainted, uh, the HPC conducts a hearing of which this is a part. Ultimately, they make a determination. There are criteria set forth in the ordinance, and that's the basis on which they make their determination as to whether or not a certificate of appropriateness is warranted or not. Now, there is a, an additional process that's available under the ordinance, and that would be an appeal. Appeals are heard by the city council if one is filed, and there are steps for that as well. I don't need to necessarily march through those. But when we get down to it today, the hearing covering all of these items is really to uh, address the issues both at the level of the plan, which is before both the Park and Rec Board and the HPC for recommendation to the council, and the elements of the, uh, of the, of the um, proposal 
that will be subject to certificates of appropriateness. And those are really directed ultimately to the HPC uh, for their uh, final consideration. Good. Thank you, Vic. Vic is sticking around, <coughs> and so we'll have a chance to ask some follow-up questions here very shortly. I also wanted to mention in terms of the project board, because the project board was specifically directed to be formed by the city council back in 2010 when they approved the conceptual plan. When the conceptual plan was approved by the city council, they recognized that there were still issues that needed to be refined and worked out and asked that the project board be put in place to work through those and then ultimately to assist the city in the implementation of any approved uh, plan. I might add, uh, really for the record, and maybe it doesn't need to be said, but I think one of the things that we sometimes lose sight of is the fact that the members of the Forest Park Project Board are our friends, are our neighbors. They are residents of the city of Lake Forest. And they, like us, are only trying to do what they feel is best for their community in the long term. And so on behalf of the uh, city council and certainly the residents of Lake Forest, I want to thank the uh, project board members for everything that they've done because I know they've put an awful lot of time and effort in this project to get it this far. And uh, they've put a lot of uh, their own uh, blood, sweat, and tears in this at no, pre at no uh, pay. Right, Cliff? We haven't paid you a nickel, have we? Well, Cliff is wondering why he got involved in this thing after all these years. All right, so what happens after tonight? Um, if any questions come up from either of the two boards that need to be further clarified before your next board, which for the Park and Recreation Board is scheduled for May 8th, for the HPC is scheduled for May 16th, then those refinements will be made between now and those two dates. If the two boards take action at their May 8th and May 16th meeting, this will be on the May 21st City Council meeting for ratification of the two actions that Vic talked about, the master plan and the certificate of appropriateness. Now after May 21st, if the City Council adopts those, there's still, we're not starting to dig tomorrow because there is still a process where fundraising has to happen and where development <coughs> of detailed engineering and landscaping plans must occur. Now I will say for purposes of public uh, disclosure, the City of Lake Forest does have funding in its CIP budget for the current fiscal year that starts May 1st for infrastructure improvements at Forest Park. It is a placeholder that the City Council put in there as a part of the CIP budget because quite candidly we have no idea what that will be. But at least right now we're following the same model that we did with Market Square which is the City will pay for infrastructure improvements that it would normally be responsible for and then we look for private donations for all of the other improvements that but for this we would not be going forward. So I just wanted to be very clear for everybody in terms of where we stand because if you go and you look at the city's budget there is funding set aside for Forest Park. And finally and I think that the Forest Park um, Project Board would um, be the first to point this out is that there are certain aspects of this plan that will have to still come back to the HPC and potentially the Park and Rec Board as they give further consideration, particularly with respect to the signage and the memorials that are not ready this evening with those kinds of details, but those should not hold up moving forward with the rest of the plan. So before I turn it over to the Project Board to address the changes that have been made since the two boards last saw this plan, let me ask the board members if you have any questions about either background or process. You might need to speak into a microphone so everybody can hear you. Two questions. Uh, the first is, um, from the plan perspective, has the city reviewed it all to understand if it complies with all current building ordinances, processes, procedures, permits, things like that that are normally required throughout the city? Yes. The, yes, we have. Okay. And so it's in compliance with all of that? It is compliance. It's spelled out in the staff report. We went through each of those issues, and yes, it is in compliance. Okay. The second question is how much is in the placeholder budget for CIP for Forest Park? $100,000. Okay. Thank you. Um, I understand that you're going to um, try to go through these issue by issue. I have a couple of questions pertaining to the front end of the master plan. Uh, you want to deal with that 
up front? Do you want to deal with that afterwards, or how would you like to incorporate those questions? Um, if they, why don't we try and take these, and then we'll come okay. back and pick those up because we might address them Some as of we those go might through be, that. And maybe it's a, maybe they'll come up during that period. That's right. Yes, sir. James. Yeah, Bob, I have a question around the city council's role with the park board in terms of any feedback they've given them or. Um, you know, have they reviewed the plan? Have they approved the plan? Have they said it looks good, but we're going to get it through a couple boards? Uh, what interaction have they had with it? I think that's important to. Well, certainly uh, back in 2010, the city council saw and approved a conceptual plan. And that was really sort of the starting point. And by approving that plan, they said, we conceptually are in agreement with improvements to Forest Park. There are certain things we didn't like, and clearly the ring road was one of those issues at the time that it was done, because the original plan <coughs> talked about potentially that ring road coming out. But the council said, let's move this forward, because if we put it through the process, the public hearing process, the park and rec board, and the HPC, we think the final product will be something that we in the community can both <coughs> accept. So the council is in agreement with the need to make some improvements to Forest Park, but they haven't seen the details and they won't until the two boards act and okay. pass the recommendations on to the city council. Okay, so for the last two years there hasn't been much interaction with the city and the park board in there terms has, of the direction of the project? Yeah, there has not. Other than viewing your meetings on TV and, and uh, I know a couple of them are here this evening, uh, but no, there hasn't been any formal interaction. One more global one. The, um, the plan, the master plan, is for Forest Park as you would describe it above the, the beach, right? Um, the, the, in the master plan text, it defines it as the 29.72 acres, which includes the beach, but it, it's, it's literally for the area above the beach. It is, and the reason that we included it, at least one of the reasons is, for example, the issue of parking came up. Yeah. And you'll see in your plan that the staff looked at that and said, we can make some modifications to how we park cars at uh, the beach and Forest Park during this period of time. So we figured it was very hard to just draw a hard line between Forest Park and the beach, and that's why we framed it in a much broader sense. Okay, thanks. Okay, well with that, Ralph, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you. I, I have an extremely loud voice, so I will back this off. Thank you, Bob. Um, as, as, as previous stated, my name is Ralph Giswaldo. I'm a 45-year Lake Forest resident, uh, previous Park and Rec Board Chair, uh, and current President of the Forest Park Project Board. Thank you, chairs and board members, for allowing us to come in front of you tonight. Um, and thank you for your previous questions and input. They truly have helped shape our plan about Forest Park's master plan. And most importantly, thank you for all you do for Lake Forest. Um, we all know Lake Forest is a special place. Forest Park is a special place. And your volunteer work is truly appreciated. We are here tonight to discuss the Forest Park Projects Board's recommendation for Forest Park. You have received a packet uh, with our master plan, and it's also been published on our website. Um, tonight's meeting, as Bob Kiley has stated, is about discussing the changes to our master plan and our final recommendations for the master plan. Approximately two years ago, as Bob stated, Lake Forest City Council approved a conceptual master plan for Forest Park that was graciously donated by the Lake Forest Garden Club. At the request of the city, the Forest Park Project Board was created to develop a master plan an executive board was chosen and committees were formed to assist in this development. Our committees were Landscape and Horticulture, Engineering and Technical, Historic Preservation Committee, Amenities, Publicity, and Legal. Countless volunteers from our com community, over 50 in number, um, have come forward and worked for the last 18 months to bring to you what we have in front of you today. Our 50 pl plus volunteers include the first chair of the Historic Preservation Board, Michael Ebner, a numerous other HPC previous board members, two park and rec board pr previous chairs, two past aldermen for the City of Lake Forest, a past president of the Lake Forest Preservation Foundation, other current and past members of the Lake Forest Preservation Foundation, previous board members of the Lake Forest Building Review Board, what we had in Lake Forest before we had the Historic Preservation Board, Respected landscape architects, 
designers, engineers, local business owners, and countless long-time Lake Forest residents with one thing in common and one goal, a love of the community we live in and a preservation and rehabilitation of the Forest Park to be enjoyed by Lake Forest residents for 100 years. When you look at the quality of people that are on the Forest Park Project Board, you'll wonder why I'm standing up here in front of you today, why they would choose somebody like me to be the president. I'm still trying to figure that out. Since our last meeting in March, we have made changes to the ring road, including material selections that have changed since that point in time. We have provided pullover parking that can be used for future handicapped parking at the designation of the city. A pathway system has been modified. The landing corridor at the Belvedere Stairs is better defined for you tonight. The viewing corridors are better defined and the landscape between the Ring Road and Bluff Walk we hope to demonstrate will not be an obstruction to the views. Lastly, we believe the amenities we bring to you tonight will not only be an enhancement to the park, but historically appropriate. At this point in time, I'd like to turn the meeting over to our selected landscape architect, Stephen Stimson. And also, as we're going to discuss, the first point on the thing is our ring road. I'd like to ask Tom Swarthout to step up also. Thank you. Thank you. For the purposes of tonight's presentation, I've taken the six points that were outlined by Bob and I've bundled a couple of them. So we have four topics here. It was a much more logical way to present the information. So I've, I've uh, added parking to the ring road discussion and I've added landings to the bluff walk and path discussion. So we have the same six items, but they're just in, in four parts. Uh, so to talk about the ring road, and I'm going to let Tom elaborate on materials. Uh, we had some concern about, about parking. We had a little bit of concern about alignment. Uh, to quickly review our alignment, we have uh, placed a curve at this juncture where today it's a fairly tight 90 degree angle. Uh, we're aligning it, uh, it, we think, in a sympathetic fashion to the original uh, plotted plan by O.C. Simons and in a naturalistic uh, style it meanders through the park. We have straightened out, or I'm sorry, taken the straightaway out of this zone. Um, I'll zoom in in a minute, but we have a pullover at the center of the park. We have elaborated on the drop off area at the landing at the Belvedere. Uh, there's no change to the road at the north end. In this slide, you can see the two or three car rather pull over at the uh, Belvedere. At the center, you can see that two cars parked or pulled over uh, at that uh, widening of the road. It goes from 16 to 22. The majority of the road is 16 feet in width, but at those two bump outs, uh, we have uh, 22 feet. Uh, road drainage is handled uh, by pitching the road away from the top of the bluff. It will be collected in a subsurface uh, system. There'll be um, connections to the storm sewer. At the southern end, uh, where we have overland uh, flow, we will be collecting water in a uh, bio swale uh, temporarily before it is um, again um, added to the city sewer uh, or stormwater um, system, rather. Uh, at that uh, south parking lot, we have parking for 26 cars, two buses, two handicap. Uh, comfortable turning maneuver for buses. Uh, we have an entrance and an exit, so there's a one-way flow through that parking. Uh, big uh, improvement, we think, visually and functionally from what you see today, which is in this photograph uh, before and after. Uh, we really uh, think about this as an expansion of that uh, unique uh, upland forest at the south end. We carry that theme through the parking and, and really minimize uh, the impact of, uh, of the car in the park. And uh, the bioswale is a very shallow 12 to 18 inch uh, depression that water flows through. It's filtered through this vegetated layer before it is um, connected to the 
uh, storm system. I'm going to let Tom elaborate on our selection of material for the ring road and parking. Uh, thank you, Stephen. You can. You can. Um, my committee was made up of uh, Steve, uh, Steve Douglas and I were both uh, co-chairs of the uh, engineering uh, uh, committee and looked at a number of different products and uh, um, surfaces for the ring road uh, from actually uh, ex uh, uh, reviewing uh, the original McAdam type of construction that was designed uh, 100 years ago, gravel, brick, chip and seal, which some people may be familiar with in this community where you actually have asphalt and, and uh, uh, dust it with gravel that is impacted with uh, rollers, uh, conventional asphalt. And we came up with a, d uh, a material that really essentially is conventional asphalt, but we, we use in the final mix uh, a, a, a uh, stone that is very similar in color uh, and texture to the, the gravel pass. So it's a conventional binder uh, road surface that you would see on any city street, uh, two courses of binder and a final co uh, top coat that has that mixed gravel. And it, we did that for a number of reasons, certainly for the activity that the children would, would I mean, those of us who've had children who participated in the activities down at the beach know that most of them are barefoot. And how do you address that issue, the maintenance issue that the city staff had big concerns over, uh, and uh, uh, certainly the aesthetic issue. And we think we came up with a product that actually over time uh, fades, like a lot of asphalt fades, and rather than have a white uh, crushed stone, this will fade into the, the, the kind of uh, uh, material that you see uh, uh, on some of the gravel paths within the community. So we're very pleased with this product. It's, uh, it's basically mixed uh, in the asphalt plants. We actually did look at a porous asphalt that, that's a new product that's been out for some years. And uh, our engineering uh, consultants certainly were concerned about the penetration through the asphalt that would eventually make its way to the bluff and found it, as, as, as Stephen indicated, it would be far better for us to uh, accumulate that water in a system uh, in uh, our storm drains rather than have it sheet drain over the side of the bluffs. Uh, in terms of uh, curbing, we've looked at a number of the different curb uh, elements, conventional curb, flush curb, even uh, uh, the uh, uh, metal curbing that you would see in a driveway. Uh, we are still looking at uh, two of those options. The uh, metal curbing, again, some, some concern with uh, the safety issue, barefoot safety issue there, but we really are adamant about having a flush curb uh, within the park, so it's just a seamless, uh, seamless uh, feel when you drive through the park. And with that, I'll... Um, could you maybe pass that around to the members of the Sure. Board? I'll let Stephen talk about the original width. We have really, really been pretty adamant. We were very comfortable with 16 feet. And for anybody who drives Spring Lane, that's a very cozy feel on Spring Lane. From asphalt edge to asphalt edge, that's 15 feet, 8 inches. Uh, so it's, it's a very, um, we feel very comfortable dimension. And uh, again, it's going to be one-way traffic. So if you're passing one, you're passing that parked vehicle, whether it's a drop-off or uh, someone parking to uh, enjoy the view shed. Um, the original dimension, I think, was 22, but it 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 yeah, it, yeah. it grows. The existing condition out there is in the 21 to 23 foot range. Uh, there's a historic uh, plat that that shows a plan of about 18 and a half feet uh, wide. Stephen, I'm going to have you speak into the microphone. Okay. Oh, could you just answer, um, I have a question on the durability of this material. Do we use that anywhere in Lake Forest? I mean, have we seen a history with this material to see how it wears over the years? <laughs> our, 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 we, we've talked to people, we're going to get the stone from Wisconsin, and it's really, this, the, the, the product is really our asphalt. It's just a, the final mix, the top coating will be mixed with this, this stone. It's their limestone, only their limestone is brown. 
So uh, it, over time, it will wear, and you'll get a different patina rather than the white look we get from a worn asphalt. You'll get a, a more brownish tone uh, that will match <coughs> than the paths. So as the asphalt wears away, do the stones become loose? No, no. Okay. It will just, it's just like any conventional asphalt, that stone will, you know, eventually, you know, go into the lawn. Uh, so the, the, the detriment with the, with the chip and seal we felt was just the maintenance issue was just astronomical year after year where they're having to address that issue. And then it's, it's the kid issue with, uh, with people running around barefoot. We thought it was, you know, a little difficult. Uh, and, and challenging. I, and I notice in this picture you have, um, are those pavers under the bus parking? Are there pavers anywhere in this um, surface? Uh, this is an outdated drawing. The, spatially it's drawn correctly, but we're not having any pavers. This was uh, when we had studied permeable pavers at the beginning of the project and we've ended up doing the bioswale and everything pitches to that center for collection. So the, the paving sample that's coming around will be used throughout the parking. Question. Uh, I believe it was said that the pavement is proposed to be a 16 foot wide. And Correct. I think I heard you say 15 foot eight asphalt out to out. So is there something happening in the other two inches on each side? No, I was just, just pointing out for a comparison. That's the dimension of uh, Spring Lane. Oh, okay. Thank you. Uh, al along that line, given that Spring Lane is a two way street, uh, and, and not all of the ring road needs to have passing available on it. Was there any consideration for something narrower on certain parts than 16 feet? I think we contemplated a, a narrower uh, areas and wider areas. We felt though at, at the consistency of the 16 feet was, uh, was more important visually. And again, going back to the parking issue, the summer day issues that really are very intense where you would perhaps have parking up on top, we needed to be able to have that, I don't know what the, the, tr the count was, but to be able to have parking along most of, of ring the ring road. So therefore, it needed to be wider the, the whole way. I want to I add to that comment uh, about the width. It was something we studied carefully. We've done a lot of driveways and narrow roadways on projects. And you know, 12 seems to be the comfortable minimum. But in this park where we have a meandering alignment and we have the need for probably a car to pass or emergency mm -hmm. access and then the overflow in the summer which could utilize the lawn shoulder. We have a six foot lawn area that's reinforced. Uh, a couple extra feet on that asphalt we think is really going to help um, keep that um, lawn from being deteriorated. So Stephen, I think I read in the in the master plan that the lawn was in, engineered for that, so that you could have a car half on and that's half correct. Off the, so that would kind of inform your choice of curbing as well. That kind of also makes it tough to do a metal curb, probably. That's so, right. So right now the thinking is you would do a flush curb, either concrete or or paver or something that would right. be at the same surface as the as the paved area. Yeah. Right. Thanks. You know, I just have another question, too, about the pickup and drop-off areas. Um, I noticed in the report that you mentioned you had done a parking or a traffic study. Um, is that where you got the determination that this is how big the drop-off pickup is? Because I'm thinking on, you know, really hot days, a lot of kids down at the beach, a lot of air, you know, pickup drop-off, and if there are only two or three cars, are you going to have lines of cars down uh, the ring road? Or was that determined from your parking study that that was sufficient? Well, I think that... Um we, with three cars st to stack comfortably and the road being 16 south of that, that there's still the ability for someone to pull over and drive around that car that's sitting on the 16 feet of pavement. We didn't want to design a drop off that could handle 10 cars because of the infrequency of that need. So it really was a balance of, um, of, of designing something that we felt was adequate, but, but not designing for the peak use. And we think the flexibility of the turf, the reinforced right. turf, gives you that uh, ability to have the additional stacking. Other questions on the road or 
the parking. And are, do you want to field some questions on the south parking area here now too? Because that shows a place. This would be an sure. appropriate yeah. time too. So let's just talk about the landscaping in that area right there. Uh, it's a nice image. Um, actually, I like the the uh, perspective shot. There you go. Um, it's a great image. It looks like the landscaping is on the order of about five foot tall at the tallest, maybe even six foot. You got a guy standing there, and it looks like it's about the same height. What, what, what's going in there? And would you, in, in, right now, I don't see any section in the plan addressing how that's planted, you know, whether there's a. a right. I mean, there are varieties men mentioned, but that's about sure. the extent of it. So tell us about how yeah, that would be. Yeah, I'm going to let Cliff elaborate in a minute, but the concept is to extend the uh, species of that oak upland uh, through the parking lot in terms of tree canopy. Uh, and also understory. That oak upland is lacking an understory. There's buckthorn that's been recently removed and some other invasives. So we plan on uh, adding a new shrub layer to that oak upland that also would find its way out into this swale. Uh, in the uh, master plan document, you, you saw the partial plant list, which has primarily tree species. I'm going to let uh, Cliff speak a little bit more to uh, who is our local plant expert, as you all know. Um, to some of the options for this bioswale. I don't know how many of you attended the South Beach Access Road issues and, and discussions we had earlier in the year, or last year, I suppose, at this time. But one of the key characteristics of this area, one of the problems with the parking lot as it exists today, is it really interrupts the last remnant tableland forest that we have at Forest Park. and. Uh, as a lot of you know, it was originally set aside entirely as a forest. So the last high quality remnant is right here alongside the parking lot. We have woods to the north, south, east, and west of this, and this in essence is a hole in the middle. And I don't think anybody would argue with the fact that it's pretty ugly right now. So the idea here is that in, not only are we gonna take care of the water in the middle through, uh, through a filtration process utilizing the existing plants, uh, we're going to use that as a connection of the communities that are around it. So it's really going to be what you see now planted in the middle, although we'd be using plants that are more tolerant and more effective under the uh, duress of occasional inundation with the water. Uh, there are areas in this forest that a lot of people probably haven't seen that are wet depressional and do hold water after rains. And that's similar to what we're going to be doing here, although we're just slowing the flow. So it should look all said and done when it's all over years down the road, exactly like the forest around it. It will be the connection of the dots. So from a species point of view, whatever's indigenous and typical in that, in that woodland area? Correct. Okay. There will be some additional plants, also native, but, uh, but that are, are more effective in the more open areas with managing more water. I'm hesitant to it's ask not meant to be. It's not meant to be a landscape garden per se, as you would think of one. It's not like a median yeah. in a parking center or something like that. So it's a forest reconstruction. And the image is great. And um, the thing that I, the, I guess, I'm not sure if I'm supposed to be criticizing or just asking questions. So I'll just do whatever I want. Uh, <laughs> the, the, you know, the master plan I think would be it would be helpful in the master plan to talk a little bit about that. And I think the place to do it might be um, early on because what it's really difficult to in this master plan to de de design every area you know and say okay this is where this bush is going and this is where this plant will go As a matter of fact we don't want it to do we want it to be able to be a document that can live and breathe for another hundred years right right so um, one of the things that I thought was really well done in the master plan is you got this front end kind of academic discussion about hydrology and geology and you know uh, regional kind of uh, uh, and it's great from a perspective point of view it doesn't really tell you tell us very much other than you, know, you don't want to drive down the bluff too fast but but it's background that helps inform someone who might not be as astute on this as the staff that generally works on on the planting side we have this this uh, kind of quick history on O.C. Simons. He, the ring road is attributed to him, but nothing more than the ring road is attributed to him. Correct. We have no copy of his original plan in the master plan, which I think would be helpful from a perspective point of view. And then I would really love to see uh, some definitions surrounding what O.C. Simons, 
how he was thinking, what he was doing, what he was, whether it was part of this park, whether it was part of his other parks, because we have, we're responding here to that. You know, that he, he, he was a designer that took the native species, he worked with what he had in terms of responding to the specific landscape, and that's exactly what you're doing here. But without having those comments in the plan and, and addressing kind of that background, it doesn't tell someone five years from now or 10 years from now who might not be as good as Cliff, what's going on with that? So, um, you know, that's, I, I guess it's a question, are, are you planning to fill out that section of the master yeah. plan and yeah. talk a little bit more about the philosophy of O.C. Simons and how that informs your planting and your plant selection? I think you make a great point. Um, and what we've done is in our HPC, our Historic Preservation Committee report, which is an appendix to the pan, we actually have all those, all those pictures and diagrams and the history of O.C. Simons. It's all part of the HPC uh, interim report. Yes. So it, it, it was a report that was presented to your board. I once understand, before. but it's not in what you're adopting. You know but I mean? it, it, it's an appendix to what we're adopting. It, it's, an, it's, an, it's an addition to what we're adopting. All of our interim reports from our committees, and, and we'll be more than glad to make it as part of the plan if, if that's the preference. That, but it is part of the, the appendices well, that we have. Uh, I, 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 an appendix is fine. I don't have any question. You know. How it gets included doesn't really bother me. Um, what, what's not in here now is a very robust discussion of the plantings. Frankly, I'm okay. not sure I'm supposed to be talking about the plantings, but I'm doing what I want. <laughs> uh, but it just seems like it's a it's it's you know a key kind of component of what we're doing here, and it does address some character, you know. Uh, and later on, when we get into some further things, it's one of these things that you know, really have to understand what your intentions are. Here, I think it works very well. Um, to continue that that kind of dialogue, um, so I'll probably revisit that on not other subjects, but I won't get it up too badly here. But whether it's an appendix, whether it's a you know included in here, I just think it, we need to not lose sight of that perspective. Yeah, I, if you I, look I would comment on that. I, I just think I, as as I listen to you, what I think you're saying is that you want some intentions on the new design as how they relate back yeah. to what O.C. Simon right. is thinking across all just, elements. There you go. You know, I, I mean, it, it's elements. not just the plantings. <laughs> I mean, as I read the master plan, the front was great, and then it kind of dropped off, and, and then it was, here's the plan, you know? And I think uh, because it is preservation and it is park, and there are these competing objectives between the two boards and our community, it's just uh, really well to tell the story as to how they tie together, how you enhance and restore uh, parts of what he was thinking across these elements and bring it to life and how you create new capabilities <coughs> that enhance it and make it special. So uh, I think it's more just that thread across all elements, not just an appendix like we have it and check the box. It's more the spirit of the plan. Is it, and does it call out and highlight the elements of O.C. Simons uh, that are part of the beauty of the original design and that will be um, part of this plan, so people down the road will remember that to preserve it. And I, I think that's, is that what? Well, well I mean, you know, can, I, uh, can I just answer something? Sure. Uh, you know, we're talking now about the road and the parking. Yeah. We do have a section coming up that Bob pointed out earlier that deals with landscape. And I think at that time would probably be appropriate for us to, to address because it's, it's, a real, it's a very real concern and it is there. It's all throughout. It's just we got to make, you know, make sure that you understand that. That's the point of tonight's meeting. But that has been and is part of our entire project. Has always been part of it. To what level? Uh, and, and that's part of what you just heard when I talked about the plants being a, a, a continuation and a piecing back of the forest that once was. I'm going past Simons to Hodgkiss, you know, which is the first landscape architect involved. You know, we're not just locking down to one time, but we're locking down to a philosophy that it's involved by several in the Midwestern landscape movement, including Simons. So you're gonna hear this throughout the plan, but right now we were focusing on the ring road and Brian. Is this an OC, from, from your perspective, is this an OC Simon restoration standpoint, or is this a forest park improvement? This is not a restoration. Uh, my name is Michael Ebner. I was chair of the Historic Preservation Advisory Committee uh, that wrote a nearly 100-page report that was submitted to you um, earlier this year. And uh, we'd be glad to resubmit it to you if, if no, uh, people it. need copies. 
Um, this is not a restoration. Thank you. This That's is all a, I wanted to know. Thank you. The word is, the operative Thank word you. is a rehabilitation. Um, and uh, I, I think I've said as much as I need to say thus far. You have our material in front of you in a white binder. And that's what will be approved by the City Council upon recommendation of the two boards. If you want parts of that to be moved up and integrated into the plan, I think we can work with a petitioner to do that as well. Sure, and Bob, not to belabor the point, I think um, as I read the plan, and I, I spent a lot of time on this, and I probably know one here as much time as everybody else spent on the other side of the table. Um, you can't but hear back there. Can you hear? Um, yeah. that? Can you hear? That's not it. Sit down. Okay. All right, I'll just talk up. Um, <clears throat> the reason it came, the reason it came across so. Per oh, that one works. Really well. What? Can you Let's try that microphone? I actually won't stand up. I, I think it might be a long meeting. Yeah. Um, so here's the deal. The plan is very uh, specific and very um, concise with respect to portions of the information that I don't think are all that germane, the hydrology and the geology. The, the thing that I think is quite important, if this has any, any chance of surviving the character of the original park, is what was going on when he planned the original park? Where was it, what was his design intentions? Why was he doing what he was doing? Because he's the first guy to change stuff. He was changing stuff all the time. And it's OK to change stuff, you know? Uh, but I do think that there's a difference between, uh, it, we don't have to restore it. And we can call it a res restoration. We can call it a renovation. We can call it whatever we want. But I do think that from the Historic Preservation Commission's point of view, it's under it's very important to understand what was going on when it was originally built, and how does that how does the current plan respond to those principles? So I'd like to see it right up front in the plan. Here's what the other plan was. Here's what he was doing. And by the way, I don't think that characterizing this what O.C. Simons was doing here as Prairie School is necessarily correct. I think O.C. Simons was cast into that group of, of uh, landscape architects, but even he didn't really like that term. He didn't like that description for himself. He was the, he said, look, I'm, uh, all I'm doing is, is I'm creating art in every specific landscape. I'm doing it, and I'm, and I'm doing certain things um, in terms of scenic vignettes and using different kinds of, you know, indigenous plant species and layering the plants. And, you know, he, he, he had a process that he was working that, that that was great, and and so, uh, and we're doing a lot of that in some of these pictures. I you know I just hate to lose it beyond what we're you know all this all this brain damage that's been going on for the last few years. Well, let's incorporate it into the plan and have it there. Make sure we don't lose it. You know that's kind of where I'm coming from. Well, and as I said, when we talk about landscape later, uh, we do have that. It is in the plan. It's before you. It's been before you, and you'll see it again tonight. That we do incorporate those those types of principles that are, uh, you know, historic in nature. You know, we do know that the park had, a, had you know, the ring roll was built according to O.C. Simon's plan. It's the only record we have of anything having been done at the park was the ring road. We do know that uh, the majority of the park has really been carved out of the forest that was there and set around by the original landscape architect. Sure. And we're honoring that part of it. But as far as the plantings that you're gonna see in the presentation, it is certainly honoring uh, Simons, Hodgkiss, and the other ones that come before us. And uh, I don't see anything up here, and I certainly want to hear it from you, that doesn't fit with that category. For certainly, if you think that we're not uh, following that, then no, you I'm seem to have a pretty I'm good grasp. I'm just reacting to the printed plan, and right. you know, my suggestion would be, you know, point by what's point. going on here works fine for me, but it, there's nowhere in the plan that talk, other than this image that talks about what you're doing, uh, un, unless you dive deep into the appendix and read the biography of O.C. Simons. Okay, we can, we can easily address that. Uh, let's try and come back to the parking in the road, because uh, I want to make sure we get through that, because there is going to be time to talk about landscaping uh, later on in the item. So we'll be coming back to that, I'm sure. But with respect to the road and parking, other questions?
proposed master plan. How many spots are we losing from the current plan? Of handicap? Yeah. There are no handicap spots over there. There's no handicap spots anywhere in the north on the ring road in the 20 spaces that face west there are yeah. currently two there and that's why with the pull out that we have added in since the last meeting that would allow us to accommodate the two back so there's no loss of handicap okay is the city planning on designating those as handicap parking or is that it is uh, the possibility is there it was designed so we had the flexibility should that be needed okay as far as the location uh, where there are cited now in the south lot the, you have them cited right where the bus drop-off area is also designated and and just you know I, I, I imagine this is somewhat the scale but you have two buses squeezed in there for drop-off and the handicapped parking I, I think it's I think it's gonna be difficult um, for handicapped parking at a time when there is bus drop off or in the middle of the day during the summer or that, was there any thought given to, uh, to the, the interplay between the bus drop off and where the handicapped parking is currently located? Uh, there was thought, and I think if we actually drew cars in these spaces, you'd see there's quite a bit of space between the cars, the aisle and the bus so uh, this meets the technical criteria of the spacing requirements for those vehicles uh, could this be flipped and put handicap up here uh, yeah I think maybe that could be done uh, spatially it would work um, I think functionally uh, with the reality being um, you're unlikely to have two handicap cars occupying those spaces all the time that the notion of this had being a little more open and, and not having a bus sit there, uh, I think we'd rather see two cars sit there uh, than buses. So that, that was the thinking behind that, that alignment. Uh, if, if for some reason this bus came in and pulled up here, a second bus could sit along that curb line uh, and still have cars uh, maneuver on the inside. So I, the buses don't have to sit uh, like that. Uh, precisely but it, it does it does work from a technical maneuver perspective other questions talking about the center parking um, for a couple of reasons first of all we were talking about trying to keep the parking in an organized fashion um, so people are not parking all over the place. Um, but also for an aesthetic viewpoint, because we were worried that, you know, you'd have lots of cars at a different angle. So when you look at the park, instead of just seeing headlights, you would see cars lined up. So, um, and also accessibility for handicap, because it's really hard to get from the south lot all the way up to that north point, if you'd like. Um, and there's really no way for a handicap to, I mean, they could, but it'd be a long walk. So just wondering, in, in your review of your plan and those comments that we made last time about that center parking and um, just those thought processes, um, could you explain why you continue to go with getting rid of the center parking? Um, when we uh, were working on this master plan, uh, it involved uh, the public uh, and all the city agencies and we and the historic subcommittee of the Forest Park Project Board. Eliminating parking from the center of the park was an uh, overwhelming um, request uh, of the design team. Uh, after uh, we met with you all in the last uh, meeting, uh, I think we felt that we could isolate a few spaces which wouldn't have a huge impact on the quality of life in the park, uh, that we could uh, do that in an organized way so that it was clear. I think uh, we had a widening of the road that was more subtle in the last plan. And I think there was a concern on the board that it would be too ambiguous as to where someone should pull over. So our response to that was to make a very clear, define, clearly defined pullover. Um, and, and the feeling was that, that if we did it uh, here, which is really where we think people want to be at the center of the park, uh, provide access to the bluff walk 
rather than putting cars inland like they are today, um, where you'd have to cross the road and then cross uh, the planting. Uh, and that this could be done pretty successfully. Uh, in a little bit later uh, in the presentation, I'll show you a perspective sketch of the bluff walk, which will show that pullover. Um, we, we think that uh, in terms of what the visual impact on the park uh, is that the planting that you see as an island between the road and bluff walk it is proposed to be carried across the road in several areas. Uh, I'm going to show you some Simons roadways and driveways, how planting was handled along those. And you're going to see that, that here, this planted island here, planted island, and further to the north, uh, we feel like those planted islands will sort of dampen uh, the visual uh, impact of those cars when they're parked. Susie, if I could um, just add to that too, Susie. Hi, sorry. <laughs> um, from, from a current use perspective, I wanted to mention that currently the way the lots and the parking works is that uh, cars usually fill in the lower level, the north lower level. Then they go to the ring road and they park in the 20 spaces facing west as well as parking all along the ring road in current situations. Then they flow typically to the upper south lot and then the lower south lot. In this proposed uh, plan that we have now, that would shift that so that we would no longer have that same flow. We would fill the lower north lot. We would then direct cars to park in the upper south lot or the lower south lot. And the very last recourse would be to park cars along the ring road. By doing so, right now you see many days of the summer where the cars are all parked parallel. And that is your view. If you come down Deer Path or Spring Lane, you see the cars all lined around the park. This would actually change that dynamic. And so you only see those on the overflow days. So it's actually on the vast majority of days throughout the whole year, the view is improved significantly by better managing all the parking. So I just wanted to add that. And just to add to your point, one of the things that, and, and we heard HPC and Park and Rec loud and clear at the last meeting that there needed to be some consideration for handicapped parking in the central core of the park. And that's the reason for the pull-off. What we did, and when the pull-off was designed, it was designed in conjunction with the city staff, and we said, we're going to design this as a pull-off, but it's being designed that at any point in time the city wants handicapped parking, that can be designated handicapped parking in the central core. Um, the, the, the reason for elimination of parking, all of our committees unanimously agreed that, that it wasn't an element in the park that we wanted to continue with. They didn't feel it was historically appropriate, they didn't feel that it was part of the original O.C. Simons design, and they felt that the elimination of it, you know, was more appropriate. And they felt pretty strongly about it. But we, we did hear the handicap thing loud and clear, and, and, and part of our discussions with the city was we wanted to give the city the ability to put that handicapped parking back in the center of the park for people that didn't have to go to the south parking lot. So that that is designed that way. I I had the I had the same question about parking at it's, let's call it the midpoint of the ring road. Um, we're one wanting to park and just take a short walk. You know that's a logical place and it's very close to where you can park now, rather than having to park at the south lot and walk all the way up to say the middle of the uh, bluff. And as far as hiding cars, if four or five people park along the road in your plan, I think they may end up being maybe more visible, especially if it's sort of sporadic, stretched out along the middle section than if you were to say turn in and have it somewhat like it is now, maybe a little off the deer path focus and just place some of these buffers you're saying are going to be that effective in front of those cars. I, I guess I'm having trouble with the resistance to that idea. It's something that we have now and I'm concerned, and this doesn't even have to go back to whether or not it's O.C. Simons, is that we're going to be taking a chance on losing something that we have now. And if the attraction to this park is that we're going to try to get everybody out there walking around and looking, but we're going to tell them you have to walk a long way to do it then I don't see the point. But if you say, yeah, well, we're going to give you places to park along the way, and then you're saying, but we really don't want to see those cars, it just doesn't seem like we're getting it. The thing isn't synchronizing for me, and I, I just... Well, let me, let me like jump in here, because quite more. frankly, this is where the city staff stepped in and, you know, and recommended this kind of a pull-off, because to your point exactly, if someone wants to pull in there and walk along the park, they're not going to be there for two or three hours. 
They generally will be there maybe 15 minutes, a half hour. And what we really wanted to be careful about, and this is just a, a policy within the city of Lake Forest, is that we don't plan parking for Easter Sunday. And we really wanted to try and say, let's put the minimal amount of parking that we think is necessary at this point in time. If we need to widen that drop-off area a year after monitoring it and recognizing there's problems, we can easily do that. But what we don't want to do is plan for having all these people park up there because quite candidly, yes, we are trying to change behaviors. And I think it was actually in, in Gail Hodge's report that pointed out that when we did the beach, we at that time contemplated taking out this parking. It just never occurred. But the intent has been, at least for a long period of time, to ultimately remove that parking from the center of the park. And we think that this still provides opportunities for handicap and those individuals that do want to stop, get out, walk, but it's almost, you know, you see this up and down uh, Highway 1 in, in California, where people get out, they look at the views, they take pictures, so forth, but they're not there for two, three, four hours. So you don't really need to have the tremendous number of spaces available that these should be quick in and out for the most part, we think. And if not, we have the ability to come back in and expand it. And we'll be monitoring it, not unlike we did when we started to enforce the um, uh, access to the beach a couple of years ago. We will ramp up staff, we will monitor it, we, and we can throw up uh, handicap signs very quickly if we need to. So we'll be able to react to how people are using it or not using it uh, going forward. How about the parking policy, just so I understand the angle of this. So you're okay in the community plan with people just pulling up to the side of the road and just getting out and walking around? Yeah, because our observation right now is um, you go down there most days and people will stop. They might actually t bring their lunch with them uh, so that they can look out over the lake. And this is what you'd be able to do in these pull-off areas. But what they're, they're not staying there from, for long periods of time. And so we think that this addresses the needs that people have for viewing uh, the lake without having to get out of their car. Uh, that was one of the other things that we've heard and we have observed is that people will take their mothers and fathers down there when they get them out and they want to be able to see the lake and so forth. And we think that this is a very functional uh, and effective way of dealing with that without putting in a lot of asphalt and putting up a lot of parking signs and so forth. And if not, we can come back and expand it based on the actual need and not trying to anticipate what that e need is right now. Don't you foresee a problem, though, with the <coughs> residents who come to the beach and find that they're turned away and they see other park cars parking there and they're pulled off? But then you anticipate a problem with them saying, well, other cars are parked here. Why can't we park here and then go to the beach and spend the afternoon? Right, but no, as, as Mary indicated, uh, and we could do this tomorrow if we wanted to, is that rather than having this be the secondary parking spot, for people going to the beach. This will now be the fourth parking spot for people coming to the beach. We will still, on the 4th of July, 90 degree weekend, if there's you know thousands of people down there, people will still be able to park on the ring road and, God forbid, they might have to park on Lake Avenue too if it gets to be that point. We won't turn residents away. No, I'm talking about non-residents who get to, to park there. Non-residents non cannot park there. But used, they'll to, see, but used to Sheridan Road. I know, but we monitor access to the beach. We don't monitor no, access. No, we, we do. We do. We do. Okay. The park board does. Yeah. All right. <laughs> there you I, go. I've never go there during the summer. Though. I, I just want to throw one more thing in, and this is maybe part of a question comment. Uh, I just did it this afternoon just to, uh, to test it out. I, I never park along the road. I never have the whole time I've lived in this community because I just thought it was sort of like it, it wasn't a very discreet thing to do. I just thought leaving the length of my car, I, I've never done it. I, I realized that I'd never done it when I started making myself do it. I got out of the car and I just felt kind of like I was littering that street. And, and if this is sort of a solution that's supposed to be better than the turn in, I would say maybe we need to reconsider that a little bit. And I'm not talking about peak parking. I hate the idea of we gotta hit the 4th of July numbers. I could care less. I mean maybe just 10 spots somewhere there where you could pull in, do your best to hide the front headlights. Four or five cars side by side is probably about the same as two lengths of cars. And I think the idea of pulling off next to your walkway in between, I mean, I just think that that's, if we're gonna to try to make that 
beautiful and landscape it and then you're going to get out of your car and be a stone's throw away from your car I, I don't see that logic it's sort of like it's right there the thing is still going to be making noise as the engine cools and you're going to be looking over the lake so I think you need to rethink that drop-off zone if we're looking at a beautification in a spiritual sort of setting I don't think that functions now if that's handicap I maybe that thought was to get them closer but I think we need to do more than just address handicap I think we have to have a provision there for the average person and the handicapped and, and rethink the turn in. That might actually be, I think, something that isn't going to be so unsightly. Right. But I guess, uh, and this is, I think, an important point, is that I think there is a conflict here on value. Because what I'm hearing you say is we want to continue to allow parking in the center of the park. And what the petitioner and the people who have prepared this said, we do not want to do that. And that's so that's probably, really where the conflict yeah, is. Yeah, and that's what I think we do on the HPC. We, we hear petitioners come in, and in this particular petition, this is completely different than what we do month to month on HPC. We get a petitioner that comes in, invests in a private piece of property generally, and it's their heart and soul, and they want to do anything from painting their front door blue to putting a round window over their tub, or really putting a family room in or that extra car. And we generally bend over backwards because we understand this is their life, they live here. This petition's a little different because they don't own this park by themselves as a property owner coming in like we usually see it. We all own it, okay? So just because they're petitioner, they're coming in doesn't mean that, you know, we don't have a say in it either. And as commissioners, I think that we're asking the right questions. Oh, okay? and I'm not saying you're not asking the right questions. What I, I guess I want to point out is it's very appropriate for the HPC to make those comments. And actually the Park and Rec Board are going to make similar comments and they may agree with you or disagree with you. And then ultimately, it'll be left to the city council. And so I think that's just the process is, that it is. And I just wanted to point out that I'm not sure that we can continue to have the conversation because really there is a difference of opinion as to whether parking should or should not be in the center of the park. And if the HPC feels that it should, OK, that's fine. Park and Rec Board will have to weigh in on the same issue then the, the petitioner will then have to decide do they accept or not accept the recommendation when they go to the city council. Yeah, I completely agree. And the reason I'm bringing it up again is because if I have to get to a point where I have to make, put my vote in for recommendation, I'm going to be tallying up how many parts of this I, I'm in favor of and how many of I'm not. And I'm in favor of a lot of them, so I'm being very uh, deliberate in trying to make a decision on my part so I said it again I said it in the last meeting I don't think it was understood very well but I'm being more articulate tonight because if I don't see it come back then I know it's just plain not part of your um, intention no, board member Berg we we uh, absolutely agree with you that it's it's less convenient we, we, we see that we've discussed it um, you know we, we got those comments back from the HPC last time we went back directed it to our HPC chairs, they discussed it in, in, with their committee members, and they came back very strongly that, that we thought it was more appropriate to take the cars, that parking out of the center core of the park. You know, there were, there were questions about backing toward the bluff. There were questions about the amount of spaces that were needed there, um, and we just felt it was more appropriate to, to compromise and put the handicap back in the park at the city's request, but to leave the center core parking out. We do think we do agree that it's, it's it's less convenient but more appropriate. So, guy, just so I understand your comment, I think what you're saying is, is that the impact of four cars parking parallel along the walk. Can you guys hear me? Four cars parking parallel along the walk is similar to the impact of having ten cars or eight cars or something like that pulled 90 degrees into the going the other way. <clears throat> But then you don't have the impact on the, the walk, the pedestrians, because the cars are on the other side of the road. Is that, that's kind of. That's basically it. And then also, if I understand this right, along a 16 foot road, one could legally park at any point and get out of their car. I think that's what is being sort of offered. And I'm just wondering if you have four or no. five or seven cars no, along there, no. oh, that's not even going to be allowed. It, only on those only. particular days is an overflow, day. right? Oh, on peak oh days. well, and I've got an issue with that too, because now you've really said, you know, you have to walk from the south lot. Big, big, big difference. Okay. Other questions on the road or parking? If not, let's move on. The uh, pathway systems, including the Bluff Walk and Woodland Path. Just read it. 
since our last presentation, we've made several uh, refinements and uh, adjustments to the plan. Uh, I want to talk about the uh, hierarchy of the path system. We have a bluff walk, which is a primary uh, walkway that varies from uh, six to nine feet. Uh, we have a uh, deer path connector uh, that is uh, seven feet. We have a lawn path uh, system on the west side that is uh, in the five foot uh, dimension and then we have a woodland path uh, system that occurs at the south end uh, which is four feet wide and we have a small uh, again th uh, reacting to some of your comments about path uh, width uh, we have reduced this path to uh, three feet uh, at the north at the north end um, this diagram shows uh, the, that system illuminated um, and we also have some materials here today that we're going to share uh, with you. Uh, Cliff is going to pass those around in a little bit. Uh, the bluff walk is something we've studied very carefully. Uh, we feel that the um, separation of, of the vehicle with the pedestrians uh, in the park is a really smart and important um, thing to do. Uh, we heard some comments about and concerns about the distance between the ring road and the bluff walk um, and we've adjusted it uh, at the southern end to pick up a few more feet of buffer uh, in this and there's a pinch point down here as you come in from Spring Lane. But I prepared this illustration to show you uh, the condition that we were talking about in a minute ago with respect to this pullover to give you a sense of the distance uh, between uh, the bluff walk and that pullover where the road is widened to 22 feet, where we have planting, native planting that's bluff planting. The concept is to have bluff planting that comes up uh, to occupy that zone. Uh, it also crosses into the park and we have some areas along that west side where that planting occurs. A, f a series of before and after drawings show you the, um, this again pullover that occurs here, uh, the separation which varies from, uh, I think at one point it's uh, six feet at its uh, at a pinch point but it, it's as much as uh, over 20 at the center of the park uh, in terms of a buffer between the walk and that uh, roadway. Further north where the Belvedere overlook and drop off occur again there's another ability to pull over uh, for uh, probably three car lengths. Uh, you can see the crossing here uh, to that Belvedere landing, which I'll show you a, a more detailed drawing of that in a minute with dimensions. And at the north end, uh, we actually have shifted the road in uh, slightly uh, because of this uh, pinch point at the bluff edge so we can accommodate the uh, bluff walk where it uh, is reduced to about six feet. Um, and here you can see, again, some planting that jumps across uh, to the west. Out at the uh, Lake Road edge of the park, um, you will recall the discussion of uh, in including a pathway to keep people out of the roadway, uh, to provide an opportunity for accessibility um, for everyone in the park on pathways that get you to areas of the park which might not be uh, visited, such as the South Woodland. Um, and a path along this west edge uh, is not a sidewalk. It's not intended to feel like a sidewalk. It's intended to meander through the park, um, negotiating around existing important trees and also would be uh, planted around with additional um, tree canopy. At the southern end, uh, we have uh, the woodland walk and I have a few images here of material. Uh, we're thinking about a compacted granular material. I'm going to let Cliff talk about that a little bit more. Here are two examples. There's a, a Simons Park actually on the left, which has uh, its Frick Park in Pittsburgh. 
uh, with a granular compacted surface. You get a sense of the planting. In fact, I might want to mention that in this image, that layered planting that occurs along that edge. And on the right-hand side, uh, a local uh, private garden uh, path, again granular. And we included this because we have a wet swale in our woodland to the south that I think would, um, would allow us, if we um, crossed it in this fashion as opposed to putting a pipe or a, a small drain under the, under the granular path or, or in, as opposed to letting that water sheet over the path, which we think would, would wash it out, that we would do a small um, crossing out of wood. Um, the dimensions I want to give you a little more information on for the landings um, at the Belvedere. Uh, you can see that the 28 foot distance between the edge of pavement and the top step to the Belvedere stairs. Uh, there's a 24 foot width to that uh, entry landing. And uh, out at the road edge, it gets a little bit wider. Uh, we have uh, a sketch here. Uh, this sketch is a little different than the one that might be in your package. I actually decided to step out a little further and provide. It's essentially the same drawing at this location, but I expanded the drawing to include the bike racks, which we felt made more sense to put on the inside of that ring road and, and to also tuck them into vegetation. We have a seven-foot path that crosses. Uh, we're imagining um, a regional uh, durable limestone. Uh, we have a sample of that for you tonight. Uh, we're looking for weathered faces and natural cleft faces. Uh, some irregularity to the pattern. Uh, you can see uh, in this entry area where you, this looks like maybe a peak day uh, although we don't have a car in the drawing, I w didn't want to hide what we've designed here. But there's some seating with backs to vegetation, um, receptacles for trash and recycling, uh, another bench, a drinking fountain, uh, and a, a bench here as well. Uh, the, the idea would be that you uh, that that space isn't just hanging out there uh, at the bluff edge and at the edge of the road; that it really is framed by vegetation. You'll see in the Simon's work and a lot of work of the regional um, important landscape architects that spaces are really defined by plants and not just edges but canopy. So we're showing some canopy here and at that edge to really try to in make that terrace feel a little more integrated. Uh, to, this, to the north, there's uh, two bike racks and I have more detail on each of these uh, elements uh, in a little bit. Uh, sure. Um, is the expectation that the paths, at some or all of them, would be maintained, i.e., uh, plowed or sweeped in the wintertime, or would they be left snow covered? Actually, that was the decision we were leaving up to the city, depending on the use. Once again, as Bob pointed out earlier, uh, there there is some, you know, there's. Uh, liquidity to this and uh, you know just how that ends up from a use point of view uh, it's a question I would say that you know Park and Rock would be talking to you know and Mary would be talking certainly we see it as could be either way okay depending that, on helpful. use I think it would be treated just like the you know the other pathways and, and sidewalks thanks Cliff Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, materials you see there, that's a, uh, that's a form of limestone. Uh, that's typical of this region, quite common. You'll see that in the area. Uh, it's, it's a, it's a uh, stone that you see all over Lake Forest, been used by Simons and others in the past. Uh, we'll show you examples, photographs of the work as it's applied. Uh, but this is the material that we're talking about having as a paving material, and also that you'll see later in some of the amenities using that stone. Of materials going to be used again. There were some questions here on just how it's going to be used. Uh, that's an example of a path material that you have there. That would be uh, that in itself is, is is not a finished material, but just showing you the look and the feel texture. of that. Right. That would be you know uh, actually physically applied and would be a 
tighter, harder okay. surface depending on what level of uh, durability we would like to have. But that is the aggregates and the colors that you would see on a path like that. It's a gravel path. But it would be, yeah, be granular. It wouldn't be, it wouldn't be in a binder. Right? It, would be, it would be free gravel. You'd push your foot in it. You could move it around. Uh, to some extent, yeah. There needs to be a binder to keep it in place. Sure. Uh, but it's one of the things that we're discussing right now on the technical side is just what level of binding. Because there's different levels from polymers to waxes and everything in between. Uh, there are... Uh, non-binding gravels like you have all at Middle Fork and on the Lake County bike trail systems that are made out of that same stone you see there crushed just like our beach is made out of that same stone crushed uh, and it's just how fine it becomes we're trying to avoid that puddle wet muddy that you get out of Middle Fork when it's wet and some of these forces are paths it's inevitable that we have some issues with gravel because that's why we pave Otherwise, we'd have gravel everywhere. So it, you know, it's this balancing of materials and function and uh, aesthetics. And we're using the gravel you see there, which is slightly different than you'll see in other places, because we feel it's a more aesthetic, uh, aesthetically pleasing use of a local material. Basically, what you have there is exactly what's on the beach. Only the beach is missing the fines, which is why you swim in it. footprint in it, its entirety I mean were there uh, other scenarios pondered is this um, on the scale of kind of one to ten the most balanced path system or did you have more pathways or less and you know I think at the HPC the, the kind of key question that I felt obligated to ask was just the structural soundness of the ravines and you know all the topography issues and it sounded like you were comfortable there wasn't any risks associated with putting them there, but could you just spend a little time giving us a sense for over the last couple of years how you thought about the pathway system and its historical context mm -hmm. and how it, it integrates into the ravine system and um, sure. I think that's just to be helpful to reiterate. Okay. Um, from a historical context and uh, from a design language maybe context because I think uh, there's a lot of uh, concern and we were wanting to be sensitive to this sort of style of of the park that exists today, um, whether it's Simons or Jensen or Olmsted, this curvilinear naturalistic uh, language of forms is, um, it, it has a lot of flexibility to it. Um, and I think that we, um, we have a, a lot of land here to, to work with, and we felt that uh, we could adopt or preserve the geometric qualities of the original layout of that road. Uh, actually on the road we've, we've gone back and adopted what we saw on plan which, which changed over time. And for the path system uh, it's a more or less uh, sort of a parallel uh, relationship between the road alignment and the, and the bluff. Uh, we feel that the bluff, uh, we're staying back from the bluff um, enough to, to, to not have an impact. Uh, we've looked at that carefully with city engineers and black engineering. Um, we considered uh, fewer paths. Uh, we had a scenario where uh, we had a loop at one end and, and nothing along that whole stretch um, and a loop at the south end. Um, uh, I think at the end of the day, um, with feedback from, from the city and also um, my intuition about uh, sort of public access and parks. Uh, you know, a five or six foot wide path in that big landscape, it's 2,700 feet long, um, really doesn't have a negative impact. Uh, I, I you know I talked a little bit about this last time in the perspective view of a path uh, it might be five or seven in plan, but when you look at it across a landscape from any distance, you, you lose that width very quickly and it becomes either a line uh, or, or it's invisible if in fact you, you recess it a little. And I think there are good examples of that in your, uh, in your city uh, and in, in many built landscapes where a path, because of its meandering and slight changes in topography, you can actually disguise these paths quite well.
really talking about. Mm -hmm. And I, I think the concern is, is that really adding these paths, you're changing the character of this park from really a pastoral kind of look to an urban kind of look where people are really, you know, kind of invading that. And um, I'm just wondering, you know, you mentioned that the goal of this pathway si system was to separate the cars from the pedestrians and it was a safety issue, which I totally understand. Um, but did you give any thought to just keeping the road following the, or the pathway following the ring road and just extending the city sidewalk all the way down and leave those views that you know we all value so much and that O.C. Simons is really concentrating on undisrupted by a pathway system? Um, we did consider it. Um, and I, I think that um, at the end of the day, for, for us, the balance of access and safety and being able to occupy this park um, in, a, in a more um, effective way for everybody. Uh, we felt that, I, I think the western path was probably the most difficult path to resolve. Um, we, we've narrowed it uh, by a foot here and there. Um, we've narrowed the one to the north uh, on this uh, northern bluff from five feet to three feet. Um, I think uh, you mentioned urban. I guess there are a lot of great examples of rural parks or fields that have mown paths or gravel paths. And uh, I, I think that when you look at the dimension of the park, um, the, the impact overall on, a, on, on the scale of this landscape is not one that, that I would characterize as urban. So uh, maybe that's um, uh, my point of view. But I, it, it's been a long discussion with the group. I know you're eager to maybe make a comment uh, as well, Cliff. So if you wanted to shed any light on the Well, thought. you know, from a design point of view, when we're working on parks, uh, you know, really urban is defined by the setting, uh, not so much by the materials in it. In other words, this path is smaller and subtler than what you have in Middle Fork Savannah, but you would never call Middle Fork Savannah urban. So it's really the setting within, I don't think a path takes away from the pastoral setting if it's properly planned, uh, planned. What it does is bring you into it. You know, it's more than just a picture. The idea is to have people be able to participate, and a path allows you to participate in that park. Uh, we did look at the sidewalk. There's resistance to that. Uh, there are sidewalks all along the east side in the historic district, so there's precedent for that. But we just felt if you were to walk that park where this path is proposed, it adds a whole different dimension that you don't get anywhere else. And part of opening this up, and certainly part of the landscape history, Simons and others, is, 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 is showing you that, is taking you on, uh, for lack of a better word, a tour of the land in which you're connected to. And this path does that. It, it, it's a connection for you to the park. It's not just a drive-by. One of the things we're doing in the design of this park is taking it beyond a drive-by into something that you're more integrated into. And a path is, I think, uh, does not define urban versus not urban. It can uh, if you add all the other elements, the buildings and all that. But in this setting, uh, it is our opinion, landscape architects on our committee, uh, that that did not, does not occur in this situation, that this is a continuation of the pastoral setting that we've all come to love. does this change the right. character of the park when you add something into it so this is a real sticky point here because you know personally to me it does change the character of it and you know just one other point about um, trying to separate the pedestrians from the vehicles if you don't have something that you can plow you're gonna put the pedestrians back into the street so I think you need to reconsider maybe your materials because in the winter it's even more you know dangerous to have pedestrians walking in the street um, plow. you can plow it Oh, yeah, it, it's just okay. a question of whether there's a need to. I'm yeah. sure that, uh, you know, I'm sure that that certainly, the design accommodates that. I, I can see the bluff walk being plowed. It's entirely up to the people and their usage if it's an issue. I mean, we have heard from several people who don't like the fact that are walking. I mean, we all know that right now people walk lake, people walk the ring road. That's what the primary use is. 
is pedestrian. That's why we have a pedestrian path as part of our plan. But I've also heard from a lot of those people the problems that happens when then a car comes. We have people in the audience tonight who have had incidences regarding that. Mm -hmm. uh, my wife has had incidences regarding that. She walks here every day. And it's, you know, it's, it's, it's not good to have to step off you know, into somebody's yard or some grass and wait for a car to go by. You have to look over your shoulder. Mm -hmm. It completely affects, you know, parks are about emotions. How do you feel when you're in that park? You feel this pastoral setting. Uh, no doubt the path is a change. But, you know, urban versus pastoral is what I was discussing. But, you know, people need to be comfortable. A park is about being, uh, especially if you look at the turn of the century and the parks at that point, it was to get people out to them. It was all about getting people out and connecting them to the land. That's what Jensen did, Simons did, all of them did. And, uh, and this path is just that. It gets you out in the land. It brings you a dimension you haven't seen. And the use in the winter is certainly a concern for us. Personally, I think it's a good idea to keep it open in the winter. But this is a decision that's left to the city. Well, I might add on that. Actually, that's a, probably a subject that the Park and Rec Board would be weighing in on as to whether or not right. they thought that the use of that path year-round was critical. And so if you want to give them any uh, advice, now would be the time. You mentioned the architects wanting to connect people to the land and that was their style back then but but they didn't choose to put a path in the park to do that well and they made a conscious decision to do that well, the and, and let me let me just sorry. let me just finish because i respect what you're yeah, saying sorry. and i respect you and and that's you know that's the conundrum with the hpc you know we're we kind of feel like we're stewards a bit on the historical nature um of this space because it was part of the first you know plat in 1857 and then when oc simons came and, you know, I think if I came to town here as a citizen uh, or we were building this park uh, south um, at Fort Sheridan, I'd say that's a great path, you know, and it's beautiful and it looks great. But it's, it's not a blank canvas. It's, it's, on, it's being painted on something that's been around in the community for a while that we're chartered to preserve. And so I, if, if I wasn't on the HPC or I just moved in, I'd be like, yeah, that's great. What you just said makes a lot of sense. It's just that they didn't choose to do it then. And why can't we just walk on the grass? and have the path highlight what was there and accentuate it around and just minimize it. Well, I think, I think you bring up a very important part. First of all, when it was first set aside in the 1850s, the roads were first placed to surround it, and it was defined by the roads as well as its topography, the bluff and the ravines. Today, it's still defined by the roads, the bluff and the ravines. After it was a park for roughly 40-something years and used pedestrianly. I'm sure there were paths in at that time. Actually, we know there were. They're on some of the plans. They used to harvest gravel from there. There was paths down the bluff to the lake. So there's been paths in that park since the day we stepped foot in that park. They haven't been defined like they are today. But I would venture to say that the carriage road that O.C. Simons added to the park that Hodgkiss set aside was in fact a path. It was a path for the automobile, which the carriage, which at that point, I think there were 10 automobiles in Lake Forest. But in essence, it's a path. It was a way to bring people another view that they didn't have before. You know, everybody's walking here. As a matter of fact, I'd be willing to bet my architectural license that that path was built on a walking path. That, that carriage walk went on a path that already existed. Because anybody who came to that park would have walked the bluff would have looked out over it. Yeah. And Spring Lane is just an extension. This path is an extension of Spring Lane. It goes to what was wonderful uh, historic geographical features to the south, which are no longer with us, and came along the bluff. Mm -hmm. So the road as carriage uh, path was built probably right where the pedestrian paths were. So you know, paths are often driven by the use of people. You know, not necessarily if you're in a college, you can see that. There'll be a sidewalk going this way and a sidewalk going that way, and then there's cow paths going each way. So I, I would respectfully disagree that there have been no paths in this park. Oh, I, I think I, the I usage has I agree with you that changed. there's been paths, but there hasn't been a path right there. Well, that's I mean, true. I mean, and that's, and, what I, that's my point. Right. And, but, and I think we're betting on that people will use it, to your point, and we're going to try to build it first, and then they'll use it versus you, you just said that there was a pathway there and they put the carriage road in, which makes a lot of sense because it was proven right, use. Right. And this is, we're kind of building on the come here and we're doing it on a park that stayed relatively the same over long periods of time that we're kind of debating, you know? So I mean, I get the pathway right. system, I'm not, the whole thing is not an issue with me. It's the west part of it, which Stephen said has been wrestling with your committee. So I think it, it sounded like it was back and forth with you guys as well. Right. So I mean, I understand what you're saying. It's just that 
they didn't build a pathway there because it was a beautiful open space and can I had such football there and you know it's just kind of a it's a departure and I just was curious let me ask a favor of and I'm going to uh, ask this of the HPC members because this starts to get into that uh, use versus function and uh, I'm hoping this doesn't happen, but I'm I always anticipate the worst and hope for the best as a city manager. <laughs> and the concern I have is, is that the park board is going to say, we absolutely need this path system for the use of and function of this park. And then the HPC says, we don't like the pass. Mm -hmm. Well, if, you ha if the city council has to side mm -hmm. on use over function, I think what we'd like to hear too from the HPC is, okay, we don't like the path, but if they're going to be a path, then here's some of the yeah. suggestions we would ask. Yeah, that's a great question, Bob. And to me, I should we should ask it earlier, but it's really important for both our boards to understand what criteria the council is going to use to approve this plan. I mean, I think we can't operate in a vacuum at the HPC level and the park level, you know, to to to, to then give them conflicting signals. So, I think it's important for us to understand how much they're going to factor in historical preservation versus, you know, this is extended capabilities in a new park and and it's a function-oriented park. So then at least the HBC will have, you know, an understanding of that and will be, be able to deliberate in that context and, and maybe dissent, but say, gosh, our role in the governance of the city is to speak for the park and the history. I, I may agree with the design as a citizen, but as an HPC member, I have to say, gosh, you know, it's a departure. And last I checked, this is one of the, I mean, this and Market Square is it in terms of our landscapes. I think that are really worth preserving. So as an HPC member, I feel like I got to err on that side. I, I think that your point is exactly right. And in some respects, your <coughs> dual representation on, of the city in making this recommendation identifies really what are different conflicting or potentially conflicting values. The HPC within its ordinance has specific standards. Those are the standards by which the HPC should be making its determinations on the certificate of appropriateness and the, the more general standards of what your charge is uh, in the historic preservation context should guide you in terms of making your recommendation on the plan. The Park and Rec Board has a different charge. Ultimately, when it comes to the City Council, they're going to be hearing recommendations from both bodies. And the City Council is guided by one basic standard. What do they think is in the best interest of the city? And is that going to be a matter of historic preservation or functionality for park and recreation? Or is it going to be something in addition to those things? That I can't tell you other than the nine members of the council have charged, have been charged to determine what they believe is in the best interest of the city. And yeah. that's how they'll make their determination. Yeah, and I guess that's why I asked the question to Bob early on, how much deliberation the council has had in this process, because it's, it's it's educational for us to understand their perspective so we can deliberate together now tonight to be productive right and I think uh, and I don't want to speak for nine members of City Council because I get in trouble when I do that sometimes <laughs> but I, I think the important thing is that the record is clear whether it's the the parking issue whether it's the bluff issue the HPC's role as Vic has articulated how does that tie back to your ordinances and your responsibilities? It's not what your personal preference might be, it's how does it tie back to this? Because again, then the Park and Rec Board is gonna be using its charge under the ordinances to come forward with its recommendation. So I would just ask that it, you know, if you feel strongly about the, the pathway, that you do tie it back to the historic aspects of it and so forth, so that the council then is understanding that real balance between, okay, how does this violate the historic character of the, of the park? versus the need that may be expressed by the Park and Rec Board. I think you have to remember that, you know, we are looking at it. Use the you other microphone. I don't know which one works. Use them both. Um, you know, you kind of glossed over the safety issue with the park and the path, and we had people at the last meeting talking about how they almost got hit by cars and stuff, and other people saying, but no one's ever had an accident in this park, but I think we need to, isn't it better to be proactive than reactive? And I think that's something that we need to look at as a park board, how we want more people to use this park, and we have a problem with Lake Road. There is no sidewalk on there, so if we can get more people walking around and 
enjoying the park and coming to the park, then to us we're looking at it as a safety issue, as a function issue, and a, a use issue. Yeah. So that's where we're. So I don't want to gloss over that safety issue and talk about the urban and the rural and putting in paths that haven't been there. We have to look at it from that point of view. I totally agree with you, and I think the city. And Bob, you can chime in here. I, the city has lots of intersections. It has lots of lights and has lots of stop signs. There's procedures in place to do studies as to whether or not it makes sense to put sidewalks in, uh, to put lights in, to put uh, stop signs in. I mean, there's a stop sign at Sheridan Road and, and Westminster, and, that, and those weren't there. There was four of them. So they study these things over long periods of time. I think if we bring that into the debate, at least from the HPC perspective, we'd like to see some, you know, something other than just subjective opinions. I mean, I, I think to be, to be honest, to let, so let's be intellectually honest about that discussion. Well, and I think in the staff report we did touch on that as well. Um, the, whoever said it, it's absolutely correct. There isn't anybody that has died by being run over by a car on the ring road. But it, clearly if you look at the city's policy, uh, we always try and separate pedestrian and vehicular traffic. Look at any school in the city. Look at any park in the city. There generally are sidewalks in that vicinity to separate one from the other. And so if you were asking me from a staff uh, perspective, what would we prefer? We absolutely would prefer uh, separating the two. Is it absolutely necessary? No, and I'm not gonna kid you and say that Ring Road has as much traffic as a deer path. Uh, but it's one of those situations <coughs> that if it can be introduced in a appropriate way and everybody is in agreement with it, then that's the best of all worlds. That's okay. Uh, uh, the, the, uh, yeah, that one. Uh, yeah, that, uh, no, just the one that you just had is good. Um, the east edge of that, so that's like uh, 28 feet um, deep, I think by 22 feet wide or something, some such dimension. Um, it, it looks to me like you're basically extending the, the limestone surface up to the first stair or maybe the first tread of the existing stairs that look about right. I think I'm, I think it would be more helpful if I jump to the drawing that okay, shows sure. the aerial sketch uh, there. Oh, there, that's even better. So you're you're uh, almost right. I mean, at this point, we've actually pulled back, we pulled back that, and there's probably a six foot landing, in, as opposed to running the landing of the entire dimension up to the edge. We've actually have a, a threshold stone there. So you're uh, avoiding the use of a railing or a retaining wall there, right? And able to just have the paving kind of end into the bluff. And ending uh, here, and then a planted buffer. Yeah. On this side, we have the uh, trash and recycling and planting, there so that go. we can avoid people from moving over that edge. And the and the material, the plant material between. I know you're going to talk about plant material later, but between the the road and the paving, is that a kind of a continue? The road and the and the walkway. That's a continuation of what we were looking at down That's the right. south end. That's right. That's right. Although it does stop, it's not continuous. It's sure. the same concept of, of uh, if imagine native plants that you would find on a bluff that would come up and cross, um, and to create that zone. And it's in, it's interrupted with areas of lawn where you could pass uh, across. You know, th with respect to the walkways, the, the paving issue, um, what, it's, what material it is, we asked that question, uh, you know, primarily because we've pushed all the parking to the south end of this now. So in the winter, if you arrive at this uh, destination, you're, p you're on the south end, you have to walk the path to right. get along the bluff. You can't even walk on the street anymore. Today, right. it's paved uh, mm -hmm. and it's plowed between that parking area and the road but the reality is is you walk in the street everywhere mm -hmm. else you park in the middle and you walk on the street so it's so it's uh easily usable in the winter most of the time you know there's always sometimes when it's challenging to mm -hmm. walk even in the sidewalks in lake forest even even when they plow the sidewalks usually on a really bad day you walk in the street until right. the sun burns it back off right because they don't plow down to the sidewalk they they leave it above so that they don't take all of our driveways away every week, <laughs> yeah. which we appreciate. Is that an editorial comment? No, no. Although I have a tree. That, um, so it's a challenge for sure because once you park at the south end of this, it seems to me that 
over the life of this park, it's not a stretch to think about these paths someday being paved. And right. so we're, that, that's, a, that's a kind of a long-term concern. I know, it, you know it's hard to address in the plan. You say we're not gonna do it, but things change. People have a hard time using things, and the next thing you know, you got pavement everywhere, right? So that's a, that's a, that's a big concern. From the and nothing you can do about it. It's just you know it's one of those operational issues. You either have to you know resist the urge to pave this in the future mm -hmm. or decide that you can live with that change. Um, from a character point of view, um, the existing simple, elegant kind of solution that exists today out in Forest Park. The question for us on the HPC is is how much change can this stand before the essential character of what we're seeing out there is eroded to the point where it's just a different park. And frankly, the designs are beautiful. Everything is really nice, it could be great. Um, and if it were a blank ca canvas, we probably wouldn't be giving you much nonsense tonight. But what we have out there is really nice, we like it. As a collective body, they haven't changed it in a while, not just because there's been no money, but because frankly, it works pretty good, everybody kind of likes it, I like it, I go out there all the time. So it's simple, it's elegant, it's functional, it kind of works. It has this historic kind of touchstone that we all like, and maybe it's only a touchstone at this point. Um, and so what we see up here is a collection of paths and ring roads and landscaping and materials and uh, you know the whole layering and layering of the solution is quite far from the character of what's out there today. Frankly, it's on purpose. You, you, you told me it wasn't a restoration, it's an enhancement. So I get it. Um, it might be just fine, uh, but from from our perspective, what we're always trying to do, and we do this with houses, we do this all the time, for anytime a petitioner comes to us, we're trying to find ways for the, for the petitioner to see solutions that address concerns, so, because we don't want to design stuff, you know, if, if you bring a house to us and you say, here's my dormer, the last thing we want to do is design your dormer. We want to explain to you why we don't think it works very well for the house, what things might improve it, challenge you to do a little bit better, and nine times out of 10, folks w see us in the grocery store later and go, man, it really looks good now, I'm glad you did that, glad you pushed us to do that. So that's what we're doing, we're trying to be productive tonight, um, and we've been trying to be productive the whole way, um, but uh, so w we look at this plan collectively as an HPC, and we're trying to figure out how much tolerance there is for all of this uh, across the board holistically before we just have a different park, before we feel like, mm, you know, this is not really what it was, it's different, it's okay, it's good, might be better, it's just, you know, what's our recommendation, guys? You know, what should we tell, what should we tell city council? They've changed it too much, they've changed it enough, it's just right, you know. So that's, you know, as we're going through these items, that's what we're thinking about. We're thinking about, gee, maybe is there a way to soften the impact of all of this change by Maybe we have a different material. Maybe we have a different kind of light fixture. Maybe we have different kind of paths. So uh, that, that's just what's going through our mind. And it's not a question so much as just a comment. M m one of the things that occurs to me, if you go back to the plan, is that there's almost no way to avoid the path from the parking lot back to almost the Belvedere, frankly, because if you want to keep people off of the, of the, the go back to the bigger oh, plan the if you can. Plan. Yeah. Uh, you know, one of the, where all the paths are, if you can find that one. There you go, uh, one back, yeah, there you go. So, you know, we could argue the merits of the path that's west on the south end of it, whether you wanna walk through that wooded area or not. I've seen, I've heard some comments that, gee, I walk through the woods now, I don't need a path. Uh, you know, that one doesn't, personally, that one doesn't really bother me. I don't see any historic reference for whether it's there or not there. You know, it's kind of, you know, it's, I, I, I think it could be a nice path, right? Um, on the bluff edge between the parking and the ring road, you gotta have a path. You gotta get the people from the parking lot, so there's no question about that element of the path. So I look at everything kind of south of the ring road and I shrug and I say, well, you know, it looks like they got a pretty decent design. You gotta get there, you gotta go around. It's gotta work, right? The question is, is, is there a way to mitigate the, the overall impact of all of these paths? And you know, when I was looking at this plan and I was thinking, hey, you know, as I get north of the Belvedere, that's like the last real vestige of O.C. Simons in this park. That curve coming out of the, as you go north, coming, mm -hmm. coming, coming north of the Belvedere and how that winds around, that's, that exists today how it exists when he laid it out. 
it's in the same spot. It's, it's more or less the same kind of vista. And um, that might be, you know, I'm not so sure that we got to pave from the Belvedere North because, you know, you've gotten the people to, from the parking all the way down to the Belvedere stairs. Um, you've got plenty of places for people to walk if they don't like walking in the street, you know. Uh, you don't you don't feel comfortable walking on that street. You got plenty of places to walk. You got two thirds of the park. This this particular vestige of the park. This is a really dramatic drive today, and I think that it's real. I, mean, I know the pavement is bad. Snickers are abounding. Um, it's not been taken care of. That's our fault. You know we should be taking care of it. But this is what O.C. Simon saw when he was here. You know, 100 years ago, and and if you change it, it won't be what he saw anymore. It'll be something different. It'll be nice. It'll be consistent with the rest of the design, which might be more important, frankly. You know, somebody else has got to evaluate that. But it's just a thought that this is one kind of remaining vestige of the original historic. If this was the front door of a, uh, um, uh, you, you know, a Van Dorn Shaw house, you wouldn't get an approval from us to change it. So, this to me is kind of like the only real remnant of the. This is a, this is this has got more than just like a like a glimpse of what was going on before. This was what was going on. This is the last piece. So, uh, I would I would really encourage you to think about whether you need the entire collection of paths. That's my challenge to you in terms from the historic perspective of the park. I'm just going to make one one brief comment. I, sure. I can appreciate your your dilemma in evaluating um, and this balance between safety and appropriateness. Um, I know you said that there's lots of things that are changing, but I, I do want to point out that um, we have a we're making a 23 foot road a 16 foot road. And that's a lot closer to what O.C. Simon saw when he laid this out. Um, we're taking out asphalt from the loop road to the south parking, which feels like a driveway because it's asphalt and putting in gravel. Um, and since we've adopted this, this um, concept of separating the, the vehicle from pedestrians, I think that y you probably have a point that this might be the notion, this might be the area of the park which might be least visited or, although I, I would say that this is a pretty um, amazing point. It's a wonderful point. I think someone referred to it as Indian point. Um, there is a real pinch point here. Uh, we're, we're six feet from the bluff. Um, and so, uh, you know, pulling that road back from the bluff we, we think is critical. And I think if we're going to adopt the idea that we're going to provide safe access and be proactive, uh, it felt logical to just continue. And I, I think we hoped that the, the use of gravel and native plants, you know, this planted island that there's been a lot of talk about, it's not, um, it's not urban, it's not uh, office park, it's native plants that you'd find on the bluff. In fact, native plants that O.C. Simons found on the bluff, O.C. Simons didn't have lawn, Pro probably this wasn't lawn, uh, and we, I presented the O.C. Simons plan at every previous hearing, I, I don't have it on the slide with me tonight, but but there is vegetation up against his road um, in some of his work. So I, I'm e eager to share that with you tonight. Uh, whether the path is there or not, I think we can continue to debate that. Uh, go ahead. And then it. Okay, sorry that I, I guess I'm uh, doing my best. The microphone seems to come in and out. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes. Um, if the path came from the south to the Belvedere and at that point departed from the outside of the ring road to through the park to make a logical connection mm -hmm. back to the northwest corner of the park, would that have the, the benefit of reducing the number of paths but still hold the loop concept so that you could walk in a loop through the park? I mean, I don't know if there's any legs yeah. to that. I'm not trying to design yeah. it. I'm just trying to re reduce the impact of the changes mm -hmm. so that, you know what I'm saying? You're saying eliminate that at this location and, and bring it through the park, through here? 
yeah, I, really where it goes, I'm less concerned mm -hmm. about the, 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 you know, I'm just, I'm trying to, and frankly, it, it may be inconsistent with the rest of the design. Mm -hmm. It's just, I'm, I'm challenged to find areas where uh, I can, I, I want to say it's simplify it, but, mm -hmm. you know, either preserve elements of the original O.C. Yeah. Simons plan or at least try to f make the general sensibility mm -hmm. of the park as simple as it was mm -hmm. so that you don't feel like it's just really, a, you know, the difference between, you know, different brands, you know. Mm -hmm. Today, I really do feel like uh, what's presented feels like a national park kind of solution. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, and I'm, I don't mean it literally, I mean it figuratively compared to what's there today. Yeah. You know, it's quite a polished solution which is great. Again, you know, I'm not, I'm not knocking the design. It's just that, given our charge, we're supposed to kind of prevent that. Mm -hmm. Well, or maybe not prevent it, but at least, you know, yep. consider whether or not it's appropriate. Right. Other questions on the uh, pathway system or the landing? Yeah, I just have a question on the pathway. Is, is the project team, Ralph, kind of in the same boat? As the parking, it's the, or Bob, I could ask you that question. Is this an irreconcilable, you know, kind of difference, or is this the kind of final plan, or are you open to experimenting? I, I'm just trying to gauge where well, there's consensus to further exploration versus, you know, we're really set on the parking and this is it. I was, I was just curious. Well, I think that, uh, you know, a couple of things. One, I'd like to back up just a second and address a little bit more of what you were talking about. I think one of the hardest things as a landscape architect you know, who has designed parks and has, you know, worked on bluffs and ravines and done this sort of thing with pathways. I think one of the tricks we're having here is that really, you know, this is very subtle what's happening here. It's not, you know, you already have a lot of these surfaces here. See, and I would disagree with your consideration of the park elegant today. I think it's broken up blacktop. I think it's six different kinds of benches, four different kinds of parking racks, two different kinds of garbage cans, a south parking lot that's an embarrassment. I think the trees have been haphazardly thrown through the park. So I think that the defacing of the Simons Park or Lake Forest, Forest Park or Hodgkiss Park has already happened. I think we're, that's why we're here. I think we're talking about a healing process here. I think that these sort of things, these changes, that stone you see, the path in the middle, already exists at the park. The path we're proposing, the, mirror, the material you have, already exists in the park. The landscape is already there. It's a natural landscape. It's been picked at, picked at, picked at. We're bringing it back in. We're bringing it back around you. I would challenge that type of thinking to say that when we're done with this, it, it, it will seem certainly far less than what you envision at this point. This isn't slick. You know, you're gonna see that in pictures that are still yet to come. The exact type of look you know, above beyond what you have here, you'll see Simons, you'll see other people, and exactly what we're talking about. But I don't think that this is something you're gonna to come to when this is all said and done and say, boy, this is just too slick, because that's not the intent at all. Okay. The intent is to bring it to you in as subtle as way as possible, make it safe, functional, beautiful, and bring it back to really what it's supposed to be, because it's certainly not that now. I think you, you've asked the question that, that I, I wanted to answer. Um, board member Preschlack, I, I think that we feel very strongly in the park, and, and I think yeah. I said that. The, we feel strong on the pathway system, but that being said, the maneuvering of the pathways, the, yeah. the, the changing of the north end, I mean, it, it's, yeah. you make an interesting point. Yeah. I, so I, I, I think yeah. they're, they're, we would look at them as two, two different issues. Yeah, and, and I, I appreciate that, that Ralph. Thank you. Um, and Cliff, I, I would just say, you know, in 200 years from now, if the French dig up um, a painting of a woman, and it's been hasn't been cared for and it's in great distress um, and they have two choices they could restore the Mona Lisa the way it was or they could add a bow in her hair and uh, you know some makeup and you know some jewelry you know they still make a conscious decision what approach to take and I think that's the spirit in which he's asking the question um, that's all and and I think the pathways I don't think they're ribbons and hairs and bells and whistles that aren't going to provide function it's just that that's I think when we're the keeper of, you know, an asset that has been in the community, Elbait has not been cared for as much, you know, kind of much like that painting, we still are going to be concerned about that. And we could try to restore it to its beauty and would it still be the Mona Lisa, you know? 
Cliff, well, and I think Cliff, that that's, let me, Cliff, that's let me have you hold for a second, because I don't want to get into a debate. This is question right. and answer. So, Lauren, go, go ahead. asset that we have, but rehab it, as Dr. Ebner said, to improve accessibility and safety and all of the other concerns. And from the park board perspective, and you've all heard me ask these kinds of questions about handicapped parking, I'm still concerned about drainage. And going along um, with the drawings and the master plan, I don't know if this is the point at which I can ask that, um, but you do have references in the visuals to the way the drainage system works. And I think it might be beneficial for me to hear it, as well as perhaps everyone else, how this ring road impacts not only the drainage system, but the sewer pipes that go into the um, uh, ravines, and how that flow will fix some of these potholes and other things that we see. Well, if you, if you see the pictures that we showed, like right here on the lower left, you know, on the drainage plan here, you know, primarily the water issues related to the park are related to the quality of the road. Uh, currently, the, the road is crowned and water heads both directions. Uh, we do know the bluff is primarily stable. We've had an engineering report provided to us that, that we worked from. Uh, the goal now is to tip the water to the west along the entire ring road, and we'll put in a series of what's underground drainage uh, to accommodate picking up that water. What we really don't want to do is uh, take any of this water and put it back over the bluff. We want to direct it inward. Uh, on the park proper on the inward section, there's no intention at this point in time to move any of the water that's already there anywhere else. We'd like to store as much water on site. In the southwest portion by the parking lot there, when you first enter that woods, that's an original oak flatwood wetland depression. And plants and trees that are in there reflect that. Some rare trees in that area unusual for this zone because of those conditions. So we don't want to affect the hydrology. Some of those big ass, giant, beautiful trees in the middle are there because of the hydrology. You know, because all of these plants are all a result of native communities and they develop with these little nuances. So we really don't want to do a whole lot about drainage except for deal with what we've affected and or what we've already affected and deal with it uh, more properly. Like the parking lot down to the south. Far more water comes off it right now and goes a whole bunch of different ways. We're not only reducing the pavement, we're now directing it to an area where we can do some ecological, eco more, you know, uh, filtering. Still gonna enter a system that's gonna end up in stormwater that's already in place along Lake, but it's going to be filtered as best we can before it gets there. So, so we are trying to deal, you know, progressively with the use of water on this site and softly and gently as much as we can. But you could see the pictures there. We do definitely have an issue, and then of course, when somebody drives on that, which is when somebody's passing somebody, you all know what the east side of Lake Forest looks like. It's a, you know, every single road has a black trough on the side of it, and you know, so that's where the reinforcements and things. Is that it? Yeah, thank you. Okay. And then may I ask another question about the stairs, since we're talking about the Belvedere area? Sure. Um, I know I've asked before, what kind of enhancements are we going to make to, to restore those so that they're safe? Well, we've kept the Belvedere as a, as a, as a a separate item from the, the rest of this program uh, with the thought that it would be rehabilitated, fixed up, and kept as is. Uh, I think it would be easy to say to the eight members of the HPC that that is not something that you would probably, if I was here presenting that today, I would already be out the door. But it's there. It has some historical significance only because it's there. Uh, we, as a committee, would have rather seen it taken out because we don't think it belongs there. But it's an asset, has historical precedence, but our position on it mm -hmm. is that uh, at a later date, another group, another committee can look at just how to deal with that Belvedere. For now, our recommendation is it stays as is, and whatever minor repairs are necessary to keep it functional are undertaken. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. I can only speak as one member of the HPC, and I know we're in a question period. I've been sitting here trying to think of a question that would allow me to say what a wonderful job I think you've done. Thank uh, you. And so I'll just say I think you've done a wonderful job. That's not a question. Um, and I think what you have brought back is the spirit of O.C. Simons I, uh, to the park, and I think that uh, what's there today is, is not a, in any way a vestige. I think we have an asphalt outdoor bowling alley uh, there today, and that's not something that should be preserved. Thank you. 
Can we move to view corridors? I think view corridors and park amenities are the last two items. Well, yeah, I would say keep in mind uh, this is not a night for you to take action. And uh, this is really an attempt to questions and answers, get more data and information, and then also then hear from the public about comments that they might have, and then close that. And then certainly at your next meeting is when I think you would make that, unless. Your, the purpose of your comment is to direct them to make changes between now and your May 16th meeting. So as to be uh, somewhat, you know, within the protocol. Um, it's interesting uh, listening to all my fellow commissioners, and, and we really don't collaborate on any of this stuff, so you're kind of getting all of us sort of sounding off. And, and everybody has, I think, really important things to say. And it's interesting listening to Kurt's comments and, and questions about about the, the path. Um, and I guess what I might also interject here, and this might be valuable for City Council, Bob, is that I, I don't think it's fair for everyone to think that HPC is to, we, that we are going to distinguish between what might be right and what's historic and make a decision on the historic and not regard, say, what might be beneficent for the community. Um, I think we. We consistently, during our deliberations of month to month, uh, take into consideration not just what was 100 years ago but what and, and, and what might have been beautiful then, but what's beneficial and beautiful now. I mean, the park has grown over the years, and to try to pick apart and just concentrate on 100 years ago isn't necessarily what we're doing tonight, and it's at least it isn't what I'm doing. And I think when I heard Kurt speaking, that northern end of the park has an austerity to it that is evocative in that you have the road and then you have this plain and right now it's mowed grass but it but it goes off for maybe 20 feet and then it curves gently and it disappears into the tree and it becomes the bluff and and maybe we can say that wasn't O.C. Simon's intention it wasn't grass maybe that whole northern part wasn't part of the big plan I don't know that it necessarily matters because it's there now and it does it have some value and are we, are we taking a chance on losing something by putting in the plan? That's, I think, also something we do on HPC, and I think it's worthy for the uh, city council to hear. We're not, we're not anti-function, you know. We, we roll a lot of things up into our deliberations. And, and I just wonder that this new pathway is, is very reiterative the way it parallels the roadway. It completely parallels it. And, and then when you stand on the grassy knoll at the top of the bluff right now, you walk away from the asphalt road, you sort of enter an area that's static, and you're looking out over the lake, and you're on grass, you're on plants. With the walkway, it's going to be a totally linear feeling. You're going to be as if you're in a chute that you're being directed along. And not only that, I've looked at that a number of times, and, and I, I believe you guys that it'll work, but that pathway is going to have to probably be buttressed up on the side and, and, a, and a foot or two away from that path, it's got to start going down pretty quick. I mean, I don't think you have 10 or 15 feet of flat land to, to, to taper off with. I, and, and it's not the fault of the plan, it's the logistics of the darn road being so close to the bluff. So I, I mean, I'm, I'm wondering if, was any concern given to the fact that maybe part of that park might benefit from retaining that kind of that kind of canyon feel it has now when you look to the north it, it becomes like a pasture and I'm just afraid that we continue to just parallel the road and cut as close to that top of the bluff as we as we are that regardless of OC Simons I think we might be giving up something that's beautiful about the park now and once it's put in well then we may go oh my god it's gone and then once you've lost it like Mayor Kerr used to say all the time you know other mayors would come to him and says be careful because once you lose something, you've lost it. You can't get it back. And I, and I think that's something that we, we need to think about and city council needs to think about too. Um, just because it works on the south end doesn't mean it necessarily should just be reiterative the whole way. 
And I think that's the kind of direction that the petitioners are looking for, as well as the city council, because I think the point is, at least what I heard Kurt say, it's not all or nothing. It may work better here, it doesn't work here, and I think that's what they're trying to understand as to why and, and what makes sense. And certainly the city council is, uh, is looking for that same direction from you, as well as the park and rec board as well. Uh, because I think then the question of the park and rec board is, is it important to be north of the Belvedere? What if it wasn't there? From a use and function standpoint, what's the detriment of not doing that? And so I think that's the kind of analysis that the city council has to go through. I guess the other thing I, I would mention though, and you've seen this many times in many of the petitions that you see, is that simply because it's not an element today doesn't mean that it's not an appropriate element going forward. I mean, you can look at Market Square right now, and uh, I mean, there are a lot of new elements in Market Square that weren't there prior to 2000. But if you ask anybody, they're all part of Market Square now. And so we have short memories and we forget. So I think it goes to what is appropriate, again, for the next 50 and 100 years, and what can we live with, and, and how do, can we utilize the space better? I think, excuse me, I think that what um, I'm hearing is that there's a certain elegance right now to Forest Park. And I think part of that elegance is just that less is more. And I think that people are worried that if it becomes too constructed, um, that it will lose some of that elegance and some of that sort of oneness with nature and just sort of that, that gentle flow down to the beach. And as I look at um, the limestone benches, that's something that I feel very strongly that that sort of just doesn't fit in with our, what has already been established in, in like forest. Can you hold that one? That's aesthetic. park yes, amenities. Yes, hold that one. I'm sorry. Just Let's kind of do a few right corridors out. first. We'll come to park amenities okay, in a great. moment. Sorry. Stephen, can you talk about view quarters? Thanks, Bob. I, I wanted to make one comment just to clarify something at the north end about the existing conditions, and it's a wonderful prospect uh, the north end is today. Um, if you look at it closely, uh, you'll, you'll notice that today this entire north end is wood chips. Um, there's no ground plane, there's no vegetation on the ground. Um, the lawn, the lawn kind of peters out at the edge of the road and that's been uh, the storage of some wood chips. So um, I'm going to talk about the landscape restoration in a minute. Uh, I, it, we have uh, high hopes for that, but in the restoration of that as a landscape and thinking about what it would have been as a native landscape, it wouldn't be lawn, it wouldn't be wood chips, it wouldn't be walkable. So we need to decide if we're going to do that restoration, how do, we, uh, how do we use that place? I mean, today you can walk across the wood chips. It's, it's, not, a, it's not something that we should aspire to in a park. Um, so that was the purpose of the path and the revegetation. I'll get into a little bit more detail. We're quite fortunate at this end, and I just want to point out we're not changing the alignment of this road here at all. The alignment is really being changed through this stretch because of the pinch point. As soon as we get to that curve, we open up, we've got 40 to 50 feet to the bluff. So uh, we've got a lot of room to, to play there. And, and I maybe didn't clarify this, although the park appears fairly flat, it, there's grade change across the park. And one of the benefits of this uh, road buffer and path is that the two can act independently. So at some point, the path could be lower than the road. The, the path has to correspond to the elevation at the top of the bluff so that we don't run into that retainage issue that, that you mentioned, uh, Mr. Berg, because we don't, we don't want that. We don't want an edge that has to be retained. So that path has the ability to go up and down, and it's buffered by the zone between the, uh, the drive and the, and the path. So we're going to move to uh, the section uh, where I've combined the discussion of uh, landscape and view corridors. And I just want to start by saying, uh, and I'm not going to let Cliff talk too much about landscape because he'll talk about these plants for the rest of the night. And this guy is a, you are a very lucky community. <laughs> I've worked all over the country. We, we work with consultants on our projects. And to have uh, such a knowledgeable expert on native plants in your community, I just want to give him a really big thank you. And he's been uh, tirelessly helping a lot of emails at 2.30, 4.30 in the morning. And this guy knows his plants. So uh, I feel in good hands, and it's why I turn it over to him when we talk about plants. I'm going to talk about the concepts behind the planting. 
and behind the view definition. And we've, we've touched on this in previous presentations. Um, we have a park that is, uh, although at one glance, you know, it, it looks fairly um, con sort of consistently as a park and tree landscape on the table land, it's really not. There are um, six communities of plants that exist in the, in the park. Uh, the, we have uh, successional bluff, which is uh, shown in these light areas, which is a distinct vegetation type. Uh, we have the wooded bluff on the bluff, uh, evidenced by uh, the, the green. We have an oak upland, which was much larger in Simon's time, the turn of the century. That, that forest is shown in a diagram as occupying about a third of the northern end. And that occurs at the north and the south, and that runs to the, the top of the ravine. Uh, we have ravine landscape uh, to the south and the north. This park is bookended by that very unique uh, ecological landscape. Uh, the area of the, of the park that we think has been uh, most um, altered and abused unintentionally is really this tableland. Uh, it has, over the last 30 years, uh, through no bad intentions, acquired a lot of different kinds of trees, and um, they have been uh, planted without much regard to the original concept of, of what Simons or what any park designer would do in this uh, tableland. Uh, and uh, as landscape architects were uh, challenged with thinking about space in three dimensions, they're def often defined by plant material, sometimes other elements, but in your park, and when you look at the historic uh, drawings, uh, there really are three uh, spaces that uh, we think are very identifiable. Uh, the sun comes down into those spaces. Uh, they're uh, occupied and framed by large, beautiful specimens. But they're also intruded by many uh, invasive or um, uh, ornamental plants that would, would not fall under the category of natives. And, uh, and we're losing uh, some of those spatial qualities that would have been there uh, in, in the early days of this park. So the intention behind the landscape uh, concept is to, to, to remove invasive or native or non-native uh, plants that are inconsistent with that uh, concept uh, to uh, transplant whatever we can to the edges to define those spaces. We're still leaving some of the great specimens in the center of the park, but there are good examples of trees that really shouldn't be there. There are crab apples and purple beeches, and you know we think we can find homes from, for some of them, but others sh should be removed. We've been working with the city forester uh, to look at uh, the plant species and, uh, and to uh, identify those that uh, should be removed. Uh, and this is just a few examples. I have a list in the document uh, that Cliff has worked on of trees. We'd like to increase the diversity. We're going to see a benefit for wildlife. Um, we're going to see the opportunity to learn about your native plants by increasing the diversity in the park. Uh, I thought it was relevant to share some uh, images that um, I've been able to come across uh, some here in this uh, slide are, are Simon's landscapes. Uh, one is um, a, a road at Morton Arboretum. Uh, the other is a, a private uh, property, a, a Sinisippi farm, which some of you may know. Um, and he was well known for this kind of treatment along roadways. Uh, and you can see the layering uh, that, occur that is occurring. On the right, you could picture the lawn of our park, the layering of plants, uh, maybe at the north end or south end, albeit these are probably too tall uh, for our islands, but, but nevertheless, uh, the notion that you have a space defined by plants and a canopy overhead, and that's uh, something that we're looking very carefully for our species selection. The slide at the left could really be um, an inspirational slide for what that walkway at the south end of the park is. It's about nine feet of asphalt today with lawn. Uh, this is a Simons uh, woodland uh, with a path uh, running through it. Um, 
the views um, I presented last time, and I wanted to do some clarifying um, slides and talk about how uh, the landscape of the park uh, relates to these views. We have identified in the park along its 2,700 feet of frontage, uh, nine uh, great locations for views. Uh, many of them are already there. The benches uh, occupy uh, most of them, in fact, today. Um, there's been um, no, no uh, clear understanding of how many views may have been there historically. We, we know that in the, at the turn of the century that the bluff was much more open. Uh, we think that there's a real value to the forested bluff that's there today. So we want to be very careful about how these views are created. And we're thinking about three types of views. Uh, one is primary, which occurs once at the center of the park, where we call it the central overlook. A second type of view is, and that might be seen as something like this, which is a historic photograph of the park. Uh, there's a second type of view we're calling secondary views, which would be a, a more narrowly defined view. They occur, and here's a historic uh, shot, I think down Spring Lane. That would occur uh, in a few places, maybe here uh, along Spring Lane at the Belvedere and to the south at that landing. And then the balance of the views would be uh, minor views. Um, and I'll show you another example of what that might be, uh, something that's really small and even smaller than this, where we don't want to take major trees down. We want to limb them up a little bit. We're not topping any trees. It's a very careful thinning. Um, so you look at the nine views. They're distributed um, relatively evenly. There's about 300 to 400 feet uh, between them. And um, we think that this, pr this protects the integrity of the bluff edge, and it allows you, as you move along that bluff walk, uh, a variety of opportunities to look up the lake, down the lake, and have um, uh, different experiences with that view. A few before and after uh, images. This is coming down Deer Path, the existing condition where you can see uh, a lot of these uh, interior trees that have been planted over the last 20 years that are very low branched. Um, we have, you know, some views through. Uh, we think this is an important place to come down to your path. This is your lakefront pa uh, park. It'd be great to see the park, uh, the view uh, from that location. So we're looking at uh, a, a narrow uh, framing of a view down the center. Uh, some limbing, there's some uh, maples that are in very poor shape. Uh, we'd like to replace them, but uh, think about long term the management of those trees in this location would allow the view to that open um, sunny glade to the north. Uh, there are some really great hawthorns in the park. We'd like to maintain most of them. We think some we can move, and we think maybe in a few instances we may do a little bit of pruning. This view is from the uh, center of the park, looking from Lake Road to the east. And again, this is probably the, this is be the largest view, but maintaining that wooded edge, this shows the um, waist high uh, planting between the buffer, or, or is the buffer between the road and the bluff walk, and also some of that planting that could occur on the west side of that of that walk. You could see just a little bit of limbing in this case uh, here to appreciate uh, the center of the park. But uh, we have uh, many instances where we're planting at the edges and that's something that, uh, that Simon's paid a lot of attention to and many designers did that the edge of the forest is layered. There's a herbaceous layer, a low shrub layer, a higher shrub layer, uh, uh, flowering tree layer. So there are four or five layers at the edge of a forest. We don't really have that at the north end and we don't really have it at the south end because what we have at the south end is a lot of invasive species occupying that 
that uh, understory. So we imagine a much more diverse understory at the north and south end. I put these in. There are, again, some historic images. Um, they, they, for me, kind of uh, are indicative of this notion of, of not only framing a view uh, with vegetation at the edges, but horizontal framing. And you know, this is actually, uh, although this is a view over, uh, not over a lake, uh, I think it's a river, I think it's a rock river, um, it's a similar condition where we might have a path, some lawn, some bluff vegetation that creates that belvedere or sort of balcony effect. We have some sl steep slopes. We need to have some planting at those edges. And I think this is a really great example of, of how plants can be used, not, not only horizontal, not only vertically, but horizontally, uh, and, and how a canopy can frame. And we're planning on using trees uh, in plants like that at all of our views. Uh, this was a, a fun example of, of Simons actually using structure to, to frame a view. Um, and I think this is probably a stone, carved stone, uh, more, more formal than we would imagine in our park. But I thought it was worth showing uh, as, a, as a framing device because he was very passionate about, uh, about views. That ends the section on views and landscapes. So. Mm -hmm. Why didn't you make a primary view for the park where you come up Deer Path Road and you're looking through the park and that's over the Belvedere too? I mean, is there a difference in the treatment in your landscaping? On how yeah, the, the big issue there is that there's too many great existing trees. Oh. And I think that you, when you're in a car, your focus is really uh, through a windshield. And, and I think if you just get a sense that the water is there, and then you can discover the big view later. And, and we often don't want to give everything away at once. So I think that <laughs> the combination of of, uh, of too many big trees, and, and then that notion that let that let that um, sort of fantasy of what you're going to see uh, be uh, a sense of mystery and, and evolve. I really like how you integrated the pictures um, in the presentation. Mm -hmm. So I think that's I think the spirit of the comment earlier. Okay. It's just really helpful to see how you're thinking and, and what inspired you to do this. So thanks a lot for doing that. And then um, on, on the northern part, in terms of the the landscape separating the ring road and the pathway, you know, if you're driving, I think you had mentioned that you know it's kind of waste time when you walk. But as you're driving, yeah, I don't think we have a lot of Camaros in town when you're really low. <laughs> but you're gonna look and you're going to see probably the hedges you know and there'll be yeah. more eyesight and a lot of people i know guy does this and people that work in town they'll they'll just spin around and, and get a fix of the lake right and they'll be eating their sandwich in their lap and just kind of coptering out and i'm just curious yeah. and i trust cliff <laughs> i i trust cliff implicitly with landscaping i mean he's, he's yeah like you said he's great i'm just wondering how do you how do you minimize that irrespective of mm. pathways you know this right but how, how do you still keep the transparency to the view and yeah you know because it's really special to guy's point and i'm just curious what your thoughts are the i think the first thing i should point out is in the plan that in what you're you're talking about two layers of vegetation that could conflict with a view if you're if you're seated in a car and you're along the road mm -hmm. uh, we have made sure that there are openings here here here, pretty large openings that mm -hmm. range from 70 to over 100 feet, yeah. maybe 150 feet down at this end. Uh, so th that is uh, shown in this slide to some extent where we're actually holding the vegetation low. Um, I think the seated position in a car is 48 inches, unless you're in maybe a Lamborghini. Uh, we, we think that that bluff planting is going to undulate from probably a low of 24, 18 inches. Maybe I'm going to let you talk about that, but I think it could drop quite low in some areas, be non existent where there's lawn, 18 to 24, where we still want an edge, but we want to see over it. And in some areas where we don't want to give all this view away all the time, we're going to let that come up above eye level. And I think that that's going to be, and, and that we see that in, in landscape, in native, native landscape. We see it in Simon's work, in Olmsted's work. 
So I think that there's a way to, to, to really let it undulate up and down, corresponding with where the views are. So when you have a view that drops down, comes back up in between views. Okay. Is there anything you want to add to that, Cliff? I think you're pretty well covered. Okay. <laughs> All right. Did that address your question? Yeah, yeah, no, it's good. good. Okay. And, and so just to be specific, on the north part where that that turn is, I, I may have just misread yeah, let's look the at location, the but is that, how is that okay, escape? So because I think that's where you kind of get your view to right. I mean, I think that's the bulk of it for drivers. I would have to go all the way back to the very beginning, and I can't, if, unless you see this. Uh, in here, uh, we, I don't think we're showing any, any low vegetation at all between the road and that view. So uh, there's another probably 50 to 60 foot zone where it's lawn. And I think you would probably see that at the beginning of the book in that, yeah. in that detailed plan. Other questions on the view corridors? So, actually no, but um, it's getting late and people want to comment. You know, this is a question and answer process for the boards uh, and not a <coughs> I'll ask a question. Okay. Go ahead. <coughs> um, the whole concept of this la layering, landscaping, the view quarters, everything is great. I, ex I, I like it. It's not represented very well in the master plan, unless it's somewhere buried in the appendix. It's hard for me to. It's for hard for me to point to. That I mean the, all these vignettes that you're showing. This is great stuff. But, and when you communicate it orally here and with a slideshow, it, it works great. As a document that has to live beyond tonight, um, it, would be, it would be great if it was as robust in the document as it was in the presentation. Somehow communicating the spirit of it, not the specific species, but the spirit of it. And, and I would challenge you to try to do that. Yeah, I think okay. we could do that. Okay. So we, did, uh, we did add uh, to what you have a design narrative at the request of the uh, board and, and uh, HPC going partway toward what you're talking about. And I see some of that in here. Right, because yeah. there's a lot up here yeah. and all the, I understand. You know, Steve and all the stuff. I just, it's just, a, it it's just a, a process question. All right, so understanding our process is very helpful to you. Okay. No, I think they can address that. Thanks. I, I really like the going to make the park a much better place because I really think they're super concepts. Okay. All right, can we move into the amenities? Absolutely. I, I think, um, Kurt, you, you, chairperson, you made, you made a great comment earlier um, that I, I think we needed to do a better job of, of incorporating it into our plan is how did historically we honor O.C. Simons and the other you know, um, people that were important in this park. And we needed to get it into our narrative better. We need to get it in the plan better. And, and I think your, your comments were duly noted. Um, as I stand here today, one of the things I started out talking about in, in, in jest was, why am I the, the chairperson? Because there's so much talent. And, and I would echo the comments about Cliff and, and, and what he's brought to this project. It's insurmountable the amount of work he's done on this project. We have another group of individuals that have been invaluable to this project, and that's our HPC committee, our Historical Preservation Committee. And on that committee, I think I made mention that, that we're, we were fortunate to have Michael Ebner as our, as our chairperson of that committee. And, and when you look at the historical value that he's brought to the city and the fact that he was the first chairperson of the HPC board, I, I mean, how fortunate could we be to have somebody like that? But the other members that he selected for his HPC board, it's just, it's amazing. He's, he's got other members that have sat in those same chairs that you sit in today. But one of the people that, that I'd like to kind of single out other than Michael and his ability to find great people to work on his board is Gail Hodges. And I, and I only bring this up because one of the things that you brought up earlier, did we look at the historical value when we did our master plan? Did, did, did we look at O.C. Simons? And we challenged our HPC board to look at all these elements to endorse these elements, to, to make sure that we are on the right track, to being respectful and, and appropriate in, in the plans that we put for you today. And one of, those, one of those persons that helped us tremendously was Gail Hodges. So I thought I would be remiss if I didn't thank her publicly for all the work she did. But also to start out our, our talk on amenities with Gail just talking a little bit about the historical appropriateness and, and, and to get amenities started off. 
Gail, was that was that a good enough introduction? <laughs> I'll be hiding after this. <laughs> I think I've probably been given the bombshell of the evening, and I will try to um, not have it explode here, uh, because I know there are a lot of strong comments about amenities. Um, many of you know that I have been involved with historic preservation for a long time, <clears throat> and particularly in helping to get some of our ordinances in place. And I've done a lot of thinking. Um, I was not on this board to begin with, but I was asked to join it because of my history. I hope you can hear me. My voice is not that great. Um, and I've tried to look at this, if I were in your position where I once was <clears throat> as chairman of the, of the um, building review board when it reviewed all the historic um, petitions, when I was on the city council and we passed the historic preservation ordinance, what would I think about this? And I think um, some of you who know me know that I'm <clears throat> very interested in how we're approaching things in the city, not only from our ordinance, but from what our ordinance is built on. And those are the criteria of the Secretary of the Interior's requirements. And particularly when we look at landscape, there are a number of requirements. And I don't mean to be terribly legalistic here, but I think it's important to look at those. And I would hope that going forward, everybody on both boards would be looking at what our historic preservation uh, subcommittee, advisory committee looked at. And that was in what framework of the Secretary of the Interior's criteria should we be evaluating and do uh, this project and doing our research. And <clears throat> the only criteria that really fit was rehabilitation. For several reasons, <coughs> this park has not been preserved, so we can't go at preservation totally and say this is how it was. Because honestly, the only thing we have is documentation. We have the Simons plan, and it shows the road. We don't know whether he was drawing what was there to begin with and cutting some of it away. We do know he was asked to lay out a road. We have the 1911 survey that shows how the road was built as documented by James Anderson Company, which has done practically every survey done in the history of this community. And that didn't quite follow where Simons drew it on his plan. So we've had a lot of flux here, but we don't know what was planted when, if anything was. We do know from the limited documents we found after we did our report that <clears throat> the city council on the same night that they authorized the city supervisor to lay out the road according to the Simons plan, they established the park commission, called a park board then. And they gave them certain criteria. You're gonna have a budget of about $500 a year, but you also have the authority to go out, get money, get plants, get labor, for working on our parks, but this was the only park. But there's no evidence to show exactly what they did. We just know f two or three years, they spent about $500, and that included somebody to police the park, uh, somebody to mow the lo whatever lawn there was, and whatever. We do know from other documentation that even Mr. Farwell, living across the road, um, asked permission of the city council at one point to take down trees and use them for another purpose. So there's a really sketchy history there. So preservation in its purest form, that's not it. Restoration, you really can't look at it that way. But rehabilitation is the issue. And that really is defining it <clears throat> as making possible a compatible use for a property through repair, alterations, and additions while preserving those portions or features which convey the historical, cultural, or architectural values of the site. This is incredibly important. We also have to, under these criteria, look at minimal changes to what was important. And really, the only thing we know is the road and the native landscape. It's also very important that we don't create false history on the site. Some of you know if you've read these criteria, you don't want to say, oh, gee, you know, it was the Victorian period and we should have one of those great big fountains out here. We don't know if it ever existed, but maybe we should put it there because that's the period. That's fake history. What really is the history of this site is the natural site and what we know about the road. 
and all of these landscape things we have looked at. So in the area of amenities, I was looking at it strictly from this sense, no false sense of history, what's really valuable, the views in the landscape, and how can we be as inconspicuous as possible in all of this. There's been a lot of discussion about the use of stone, and I know you're all gonna be going over some of those drawings. I personally have done um, a lot of digging around to see where Simons used stone, and he did, but also looked at some photographs of other parks in the period, and there's a lot of stone in them. And weathered, it is quite inconspicuous. Part of it is you should be able, if you put something in, to take it out and leave what's there and valued. So I guess I would hope that you would look at this in the way that I've looked at it, and that is according to the rehabilitation standards. And is this kind of treatment subtle, weathered? Does it not distract from the view? But keep in mind also the scale of this park. We're talking about up here on the bluff, 10 acres. Uh, we've talked about less than 3,000 linear feet in that short definition, but it's really more like 3,200. So when you're talking about, I don't know the exact number of benches, but maybe 10 benches, they're like about 300 feet apart. So you really have to get a big picture on this looking at rehabilitation. There are a couple of other things that I would like to say um, relating to this, and I hope that people will keep an open mind about it. Um, <clears throat> Simon did use stone. There are some examples um, here in Illinois, in Lowell Park, in Dixon, Illinois. There are some things there, I will tell you, that were designed by Simon, and I, think, I personally think they're quite hideous. They are great big boulders. They don't blend in. Yes, okay. <laughs> All right. Um, and that's quite conspicuous, but it is also of the period in which it was done. There is a, um, a bluff walk, a bluff river, a river walk in this park, and that has a lot of stone treatment, which specifically on the site says was concrete overlaid with native stone. So it's not incompatible to be using that. In the Nichols Arboretum at the University of Michigan, uh, that's a place where they have used stone tables, stone benches of various sorts um, that have been added in later years. Um, one of the experts on Simons who did all the preface on his book Landscape, uh, Landscape Gardening um, is the in charge of the Nichols Arboretum. In our own community, and Art Miller can speak to this more directly, we have used a lot of stone in various ways over time. Uh, a lot of it with various landscape architects who have worked in our city over the period of time. So I would hope that you would keep some of these ideas in mind within the framework of rehabilitation, because that's what we're really talking about here. Rehabilitation allows for planning for the next 100 years. <clears throat> you know, we're, I can understand the city's perspective on this if I were sitting in that chair, because our city will continue to grow to some degree, even though we're mostly built out, and there are gonna be more people using this park over time. So long range, there has to be long range planning for the use. Again, that is within the rehabilitation standards. So I probably said enough without your illustrations, but if there are questions, I would be happy to take them from, from my perspective of experience in the community. And again, to say, I hope that everybody will look at this within the standard of rehabilitation. I refer you to the um, rehabilitation guidelines that are part of the appendix of the Historic Preservation Committee's report. Um, and I would like to say too that every area where we have considered this evening was considered by the Historic Preservation Commission, committee, subcommittee of the Forest Park Board. And really, all of our concerns there have been addressed. Uh, there was an email that I sent earlier and I think you all have have looked at that. So that's all I'll say for the moment. And you guys can say something else. Uh, 
uh, our concept for site amenities was to introduce a family of elements that are unified in material, natural, durable, low maintenance, and sensitive to this historic setting. I have uh, some examples of uh, lighting, bike racks, drinking fountain, recycling and trash receptacles, picnic tables, and park seating. Um, we have stone and uh, wood to talk about. So in, we've added more detail to these drawings. Um, we've actually revised them quite a bit, put a lot of dimensions to try to be as specific as I th we think we need to be. Today, the park, um, just a few examples of what's there, um, and, and it's quite eclectic. Uh, there's some contemporary, there's um, maybe what Gail refers to as false history, and some really uh, kind of run-of-the-mill, off-the-shelf furniture. Uh, it functions, it's uh, movable, uh, and it's very ordinary. Uh, this is no ordinary park. Um, and as um, we need to be sensitive t to what we build, we, we would like to build something that's permanent, and I think that uh, Gail's point about the 27 or 3,000 square uh, linear feet uh, gives me um, um, less concern because we have so many feet uh, between these elements and we have planting to integrate them with. Uh, I want to start with the site lighting. Um, we currently have uh, 17 existing pole lights. We think they're just fine. Uh, they're historic uh, city lights. They are represented here by the yellow uh, dots. Uh, we, we would like to remove three that occur along the southern walkway between the ring road and south parking. We think that the scale of these fixtures is more consistent with a roadway. And uh, we think they feel awkward in that up in that uh, Oakland, uh, Oak, uh, woodland. So we're proposing a stone, a natural stone, limestone uh, bollard that's shown in red here. The before, that would be along that stretch. We'd also imagine, uh, and these are low level uh, lights, I'll give you more detail in a minute. We'd have one situated at the top of the south landing, um, the stair here, uh, and the overlook, and the belvedere. So those locations currently have a fixture uh, that's mounted on a post or on a, on a banister. And uh, we think that low level lighting there for safety is, is imperative. Uh, we're proposing uh, eight fixtures uh, in total of that. And we are, um, again, uh, removing uh, the three. Several of these will need to be relocated with the shifting of the road. A little more detail on that uh, fixture. Uh, we'd like to acquire uh, limestone that's regional, that has a weathered face and, and split face. Uh, we recognize in order, to, in order to actually make a light that functions uh, and embed it in this column or this post, that it's uh, 28 inches high, it's very low, easy to embed in vegetation, very durable, that there would be a core drill in the center and a low wattage fixture that could be tucked up underneath and we'd like to use LED which would give you thousands of hours of use. Uh, there are warm LED lights that would be sympathetic to the light quality that you'd want, very similar to incandescent light bulbs. Uh, we think we can make that work. Um, the bike rack is the next element. Uh, we. Uh, this was something that Gail recommended and I thought it was a very uh, clever idea about um, a very unobtrusive way to, um, to corral bicycles, to have a, a slot between uh, two pieces of stone, and then a very simple rail that you could use as a locking device. So these can be, these can be used in tandem. Um, there's dimensions on here. I won't go into a lot of detail, but basically there's a concrete uh, slab underneath to hold this. Uh, it's all that natural uh, limestone that we uh, circulated earlier. There's uh, at least one drinking fountain in the park today. Uh, we think it would make it makes sense to maintain a fountain, actually two, 
we showed one in our landing at the Belvedere, and we're also showing one at the landing at the south end. Uh, this could be uh, constructed out of that same stone, several pieces uh, stacked. Um, might even, if, if you had an interest, be able to do this out of a single stone. This meets uh, handicap accessibility. Uh, these are all pretty standard dimensions uh, for, for fountains. The trash uh, bins, uh, we really think that it would be nice to be able to corral them, not have the, you know, the shiny black um, steel bins that you often see, uh, but to embed them in a, uh, in a housing of, of rough stone with a stone slab. Uh, we're thinking about that being a custom um, custom-made bin that has wheels so it can be easily pulled out uh, with a liner. And um, again, that would be on a slab to make sure that doesn't move. But a very uh, simple use of that, of that stone. Uh, the benches, there are currently in the park 11 benches uh, existing. We're, we're proposing 18. We, we think that um, that there's a shortage and uh, there's some great opportunities out to the to the north for seating. Um, there are a couple in the center. We'd like to move one of them out but replace uh, one that's there with uh, what we're going to show you in a minute. We're also showing on this plan some picnic tables shown by the dot. There's one, two, three, four, five, and one at the south end. Uh, the picnic tables are, uh, again, the limestone. Um, I've seen these in parks. We have a picture of one that's maybe not quite what we're thinking. I think this drawing represents uh, better what we're thinking, but you are able to obtain these slabs with weathered surfaces and large sizes, and uh, I think that that, um, that would give us the durability. Uh, we're only using a few in the park. Uh, if others are needed, there may be the opportunity to add in the future, but we think we'd like to start with just a few. The seating, uh, which I've already uh, shared this uh, drawing with you earlier today, uh, I want to just start here because this location has um, three types of um, seating. It's all a combination of stone, uh, stone and wood or stone. Uh, there's only one example in the park or one one seat wall in the park at the center which is all stone and the others all have wood uh, elements and I'll show you a little more detail uh, in a minute but you can see at this location um, which is really the the great view at the center of the park and there is some grade change uh, through here and in section if you look at the red dash line that's roughly the existing grade we have the opportunity to notch or embed this low stone element uh, so that from the walkway you don't actually see it. You, it's just a very small um, lip and that you could come around on that lawn and sit there in a very unobtrusive way. And that uh, behind that walkway, uh, we're showing a bench here that would be embedded in that vegetation. Uh, here's an example here, an example here. and. Uh, our thinking there is that there's a way to combine some uh, locally harvested white oak planks uh, to be milled and uh, engage them with these um, weathered blocks of stone um, and to have actually a little bit of variability to not just cookie cut bench, bench, bench. There are places in a park where you're likely to have more people. There are places in the park where it's nice to have a small bench so we think that what makes what would make this uh, a, a unique um, set of amenities is to have some flexibility depending on where you are in the park so it doesn't feel like it's off the shelf and that we would in more intimate areas uh, use some of the smaller dimensions so this bench for instance will range from eight feet to 12 feet there's a stone component there's a wood component uh, that could range from five to seven so depending on where it is in the park, you could adjust the size accordingly. The bench with the back, uh, and I maybe should have pointed it out, and I can do that in a minute. Uh, we have, um, I'm just going to give you the, the 
quantity. We have, uh, we know that for comfort, uh, we want to preserve the number of benches with backs. In fact, we want to increase the number. Uh, we're proposing uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight benches with backs. And um, there could be more. I, I think that we were trying to um, limit the amount of backs that came up in the landscape. And when we use them, we use them where we have vegetation. But you know, this curve is actually very similar to the curve that you'd see on some of the historic benches. And we had some questions last meeting about uh, the Victorian benches uh, at, the at the beach. And I think that, to me, what's great about those benches is not what they look like, it's what they feel like. <laughs> and so we looked at them carefully, and we looked at a lot of benches. We've designed a lot of benches. And I think that to, to look at the, uh, the ergonomics of that uh, and to use the wood is what's what's critical and to have stone as opposed to cast iron which you're going to need to deal with rust and replacement um, and with this would be a, a powder coated um, stainless frame um, that would be gray dark gray that would match the wood when the wood weathers and that would be joined to the uh, stone uh, substructure and so these are some of the dimensions. You can see, again, the variability, four feet to seven on that back. Uh, this stone uh, support at the end uh, would also vary from two to four feet. And here are the cross-section uh, dimensions. The stone is, the site is not without stone, al although it is maybe not in the current form, the form that we would use. Um, there is a lot of stone out there, and I think that um, with these benches spaced out as far as they are and integrated into the landscape, that uh, they'll actually feel quite at home in this park. And that's my last uh, slide. Questions yeah. on park amenities? Seems like you have at least a couple functions for these lights. You have sort of pedestrian lighting at gathering spots at like the top of the belt in here, and the entrance to the deer path, and then you have another set of lights where you're removing the existing lighting and putting in light past the light. Is that that fair? Yeah, that's fair. Okay. Um, why don't we why don't you just leave the existing lights in in the southern path rather than add these these pedestrian lights you seems to me you'd be losing illumination and it would be darker through that 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 portion and those lights there are already consistent with a lot of the lights that you're they're, you're leaving the majority of lights that you're leaving in the park why add this new element and change it up I think our feeling was that element is used throughout the city and it's um, typically associated with a roadway. It's a roadway scale light fixture. It's probably 16 or 18 feet high, maybe taller. And to have that on a gravel path in the forest seemed uh, inconsistent with uh, the concept of, of occupying that space. And that if you look at many institutional spaces or parks, you'll see a hierarchy of lighting. There's lighting for parking, there's lighting for roads, there's lighting for pathways that are more human scale. So I think that we felt like um, that would be an opportunity to really enhance that woodland walk experience, to not have those high lights in the canopy, and that we can provide enough illumination for safety. Um, that we didn't want to add too many of those lights. Uh, these exist currently here, and there's a need for something here. Adding another light like that seems like overkill. So uh, these are 28 inches high. They're not even the height of the table. So we, well, I think we felt like that would be a very subtle way to uh, provide illumination. What, what, what are 20 inches high? 28 inches high. These 28 inches. 28. So they're a couple inches short of the table we're sitting at. You know, I would, 
if it was consistent all the way through, I could see your point, but it's kind of getting lost on me since we're keeping, you know, 15 or 20, I didn't count them all up, other lights. Uh, um, the light that you have, the pedestrian light that you have at the entrance to, for, from Deer Path, that seems to be adjacent to a, to a city mm -hmm. light. What, what is the purpose of that if there's already a, a, a light pole there that would give illumination? Is it more, you know? I think we felt like that was consistent with um, that path, that you would begin that path with a pedestrian light and end that path with a pedestrian light at the Belvedere. You know, arguably maybe that one is optional in terms of, in terms of need from from illumination we'd probably want to look at the illumination that's out there now um, but there's there's a big gap here there's a gap here and and we felt like we're 45 feet off the roadway that we probably want something at the top of that stair so uh, some of those lights exist today I guess there's there's a fixture here there's a fixture here and there's a fixture here and those are not those are plastic or aluminum fixtures that are, again, off the shelf. So we, we looked at that as a second level lighting that would be replaced with something that would be consistent with the benches. And the, the other, oh, I'm sorry, the other thing that occurs to me about these lights at the top of the Belvedere and the other one, they seem to be adjacent to vistas. And if you're there, you know, at night trying to experience, uh, you know, the, this, these vistas, I would think you'd, you know, it'd be much more pleasant without any lighting in those areas to, you know, bring in the shine off the lake or the glitter of the water or whatever, you know, the experience is trying to be from those vistas rather than, and I know they're low level lights, but rather than having any lighting there that may distract, uh, detract from that. Um, was any thought given to that interplay? That's why they're 28 inches high and they're down lighting. We, we, this is not something you'd see with your eye. If you're looking out, your eye level's five feet or higher. So I, I wouldn't want a light that was uh, less, more subtle than that because we're not gonna provide for safety. Um, I think adding another street light would be another option clearly, but I think that that would be more light. Mary, yeah, there's low level lighting there now. Yeah, yeah. don't we already yeah. have low level lighting for Forest yeah. Park? You do. And this is just replacing and augmenting that. So it's already been in, pa in the park. Okay. Yeah, I think they're really a couple close. of those areas, that's correct. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's there for safety and illumination of paths and things like that. Okay. Yeah, they're, we, black, we they're frequently black aluminum lights that are weighed that are about 42 kind inches of high. Home Depot. And they're, they're really critical for um, our staff that help monitor those stairs and those ramps in the evening hours and the, those who boat and come up those ramps and have to get to their cars and things. It gives them just enough lighting to see those ramps, entrances, and those stairways for our staff to stand in a safe situation as well. Um, as far as the benches go, I, my are these softened from what we saw before, or are they the same as we saw before? No, they're different. They, they yeah. seem, they seem yeah. much less bulky, yeah, they which are. I like. You know, I'm, not, yeah. I'm not completely sold on this, this, you know, all the stone, but it seems much less bulky than we, we had you, before. You're, you're right. I'm especially worried about the trash receptacles and the... Uh, and the picnic benches, they seem to be, um, seem to be much more monolithic. And I'm wondering, is, was there any design thought uh, combining, softening them and combining them with wood somehow so they, they aren't quite, you know, that imposing, I guess, would be the word I'm looking for. I think one thing to look at here is the city has a major maintenance issue with the benches. Oh, I'm sorry. Excuse me. One thing to look at here, and one reason we came up with on the committee with looking at alternatives, is because the city has a major maintenance, expensive major maintenance issue with the benches at the beach, and part of it is to get a material that essentially doesn't need maintenance. If a stone breaks, you can replace the stone, but it's not like stripping and varnishing and taking off those memorial plates every year and or having to take things away and store them and work on them in the winter and this kind of thing so part of this is is for that issue and um, actually um, you know when you looked at the bike rack 
That is <clears throat> something that they use um, on Middleton Place Plantation in South Carolina. A different thing there, there's this totally wood. But when something is weathered, stone or wood, it becomes very inconspicuous in the landscape. And that's part of the objective with all of this. Um, trash, again, you know, you, you have to deal with it in some way. And what we're trying to avoid are these black, high, overspilling kinds of things that we see around the city in, in tough times. And these could be easily, this type of thing can be easily dumped and taken care of. So just a couple of comments there. receptacle and the picnic bench was was other things looked at you know that may may combine and reflect what you did with the benches you know a combination of stone and wood or we, we looked at different sizes um, we didn't in, we did not incorporate wood into the trash receptacle we felt like um, I, I think that that didn't feel um, permanent enough um, I, it was more a focus on size. You know, these are uh, less than three feet high, and it's, I don't have the dimension, but this is five foot six inches uh, long and two foot six. So it's uh, smaller than one of these tables, um, and it's in a big landscape. So when, if you recall how they were sited, these, uh, these have plants around them on two sides. So uh, I think the feeling was that this, this would, would blend in with the native surroundings. Okay, those are my questions. Okay. Thank you. Other questions? Yes, you just had a question from last week. This evening. Uh, we talked about the analogy of the, the interplay between the tabletop and the beach. It's kind of like a living room and a family room. And, mm -hmm. and maybe you could throw in um, you know, the south you know, kind of boat ramp as the rec room. And I was kind of wondering, do you feel comfortable that they're all kind of integrated and they play off each other well. So if you're up top of the Belvedere and you're walking down, you won't feel like, you know, you've, there'll be some continuity and things. And I'm just curious in, in your redraft if, you know, yeah. you thought about that and, and did something different and just was curious what your thoughts were. You, I think that to me that discussion related mostly to the benches. Um, and the change we made, uh, although may seem subtle, I think, um, it does uh, reflect some continuity um, in my eyes uh, is the, the using the curve of the Victorian bench uh, as a as a curve for the back of this bench and um, I, I think I firmly sort of sit in the camp that Gail does about the, the false history and the notion that that this really shouldn't be a park that is decorated with, uh, with Victorian era furniture. Um, there's always a benefit to continuity. Uh, I think that because there's such a great change between the two and you actually can't see one from the other, I, I'm not concerned about that disconnect. Um, and I think that this is the right direction for this part of the park. Other questions? Well, if not, we might be at the point of the meeting for public comment. Uh, let me reiterate before I call the first name off, I'm going to take people in the order that they signed up, but because we have almost 30 people who have signed up, I'm going to be a stickler for sticking to the three minutes. Uh, keep in mind that you are permitted to submit written comments to both the HPC and the Park and Rec Board, and I'm going to take them in the order that they were signed up with one exception. Uh, Willard Bunn has to get up really early tomorrow, so Willard asked specifically if he could go first. So Willard, I'm going to uh, let you go first. Thank you, Bob, and I truly mean that. Uh, my name is Willard Bunn. My address is 1435 Lake Road. My association from the park comes from uh, jogging there most evenings for the last 20 years, so I do have some familiarity with it. I have to say I'm four square behind the plan in terms of the landscaping, the architecture, the sight lines, but what I'm really behind are the walkways because I think they present a suitable compromise to vehicular and pedestrian traffic. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and good night. And good night, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Uh, John Powers. Thank you, Bob. John Powers left. Okay. Craig Bergman. Well, hello, everybody. I'm Craig Bergman. My address is 1065 Acorn Trail. I have been a member of the Landscape Advisory Committee for Forest Park, and uh, I've done some landscaping in some of your <laughs> landscapes around the, around the town. Uh, I just had a few comments because I, in some ways I feel I'm an, I'm an insider looking out and an outsider looking in. I've only been a resident of Lake Forest for the last two years. I've worked in Lake Forest for over 30 and I have uh, been in the back roads, on the public roads, and definitely ate my lunch at Forest Park. Uh, I love the site of Forest Park. I love the native trees in the park. And I remember the Mother Nature created our first master plan of Forest Park. Simon's carved our park out of nature. I feel like we need to repair and rehabilitate it now for the park's long-term health because of what we have not done to the park over the last 50 years. Embracing the natural world here at the park is such an incredible asset to the master plan, plan proposed, and I as a design professional and plant person, I truly support the sensitivity to our nature, or excuse me, to our native plant community and supplementing of it in an intelligent, responsible way as Stephen has done. So, thank you. Thank you. Chris Sakiria, did I say that right? Sakira. You're going to have to speak up, sir. 540 Mayflower in Lake Forest. Thank you. Bottom line, what will be the cost to us taxpayers when you tear up the, and move the road and the parking? And what will be the cost to build and maintain the new landscape design plans to the taxpayers? We, we, at the last meeting at Gorton that we had, the engineers, the city engineers, said the base of the ring road was good and solid. It only needed resurfacing. Will this new road that's proposed support the heavy tree cutting trucks that frequently are on this ring road that I've seen there in January? And there are a lot of heavy, heavy equipment, city trucks as well. And is safety an issue? I, I've walked through this forest park for 45 years at different times of the day, and I've never been threatened by cars or bikes. But for those who do feel threatened, why not put in some temporary speed bumps or permanent ones? That's a lot less ugly than carving sidewalks and paths through this lovely green unbroken lawns on such a small park. Temporary speed bumps can be removed without, with no damage to the roads. I've seen them in Texas on, on, on uh, gated communities that have trucks and children on the roads. You know, and, and, and here, they can cost anywhere from $18 on up. And they're manufactured by Granger. By plastics are unique. And, uh, and uh, well, anyway, I have the, the list here. Uline also manufactures them. They're, you can find them on the internet. So that's, that's about all I have to say. A and it's a lovely park already. It's a perfect setting for the lake in the winter, in the summer. It doesn't need a complete makeover. I think it's beautiful as it is. Let's, let's not do too much to it. Thank, Thank you. you. Tom Swarthout. Well, I have to get up earlier than Willard, but I, uh, I just had one comment. I, I already spoke, and I 
I just wanted to uh, recognize uh, somebody that uh, has been in this town a long time, a lot longer than Preschlack, uh, but uh, he, he's been serving the city for, for many years, uh, and uh, uh, he spent a lot of time at West Park. I think it's his last meeting. Uh, for those of us who have appeared in front of the uh, Building Review Board and the HPC in the past, there's one guy that we always knew got it, and Guy Berg has always gotten it. And I just want to thank him for his many, many years of service on the HPC. Thank you. We'll look for a few more of those guys right now. Um, <laughs> let's see, Paul Bergman. Gordon is accepting Gordon. donations for softer yeah. chairs. <laughs> um, so I'm a little stiff. I apologize for that. Uh, my name is Paul Bergman. I am a resident of Lake Bluff, um, but I'm a member of the uh, Friends of Forest Park group, as well as being on the uh, Forest Park board. Um, so I'm sort of, sort of dually represented here. But <clears throat> most importantly, my father was the uh, last partner with Stanley Anderson and designed the Belvedere and the Beach House. So I have a great deal of interest in Forest Park, um, both architecturally and um, stylistically. Um, we've seen the Forest Park project move back and forth, and we've been through countless meetings on all of this. And I have been an advocate of doing less in the park ever since this project came up. The park has existed for over 116 years, with very few major changes in the park, aside from cutting out the south end of the of the driving part of the road, there has been virtually no changes in this park. And I think that speaks to the subtlety and the sophistication of the design. It's a design that satisfied everybody's uses over 116 years. So we have to be very careful if we're going to make uh, substantial changes to the park. Uh, at the last HPC meeting, Ralph Giswaldo uh, carefully explained that the cost of all of the infrastructure was firmly in the city's budget. Um, that perhaps hadn't been fully articulated before. Bob Kiley reiterated that this evening. If those costs are firmly in the city's budget, then I think the city needs to take a look at doing the absolute minimal in this park. What can they do to make this park uh, a, a restoration project, but also go back and do the least amount of work possible? Check and see if the drainage is working. As far as I can tell, the drainage is working. Every time you go through the park and after a storm, uh, there's only there's minimal puddling, but you don't see huge ponds and um, d depths of water. What would it take simply to regrind the road, replace the edge work, come in and repave the road as it exists, and then from there establish a uh, landscape plan that goes along with that, and then from there establish a an amenities plan. But I think the starting point needs to be also taking a very close, very clear look at doing the absolute minimum. I think if Lake Forest did that, they could come up with a number of wins in all of this. They could enhance the park. They could enhance the O.C. Simons uh, contribution uh, to the project. Um, they could make a very firm commitment and a very firm statement about the city's <laughs> commitment to preservation. This is a city that has over 40 years of uh, commitment to um, architectural and landscape preservation, and I would like to see them support that. So, thank you. Thank you, Paul. Uh, Mark Goodman. Uh, like Paul, I'm also a member of uh, the Forest Park Project Board, also a resident of Lake Bluff. The question was asked earlier, somewhat in jest, what would O.C. Simon do? And is, is that a question we ask ourselves? It is, at one point I thought of have, having yellow plastic bracelets made up saying WWOCST, but decided not to do that. And I think somewhat the answer is we don't know. <laughs> we really don't know. It was designed at a time when, what did Cliff say, there were about 10 cars in the city. Cars at that time were really just carriages. They put a motor on. 
cars didn't go faster than five miles an hour at the time this uh, park was designed. That's about the speed of a fast walker. Uh, the cars were narrow, they were lightweight. So did he envision Escalades, <laughs> Crown Victorias? I, you know, would he have designed a separate walking path if he had? Would he have designed the parking, you know, different parking spots? We don't know. But I think we all approach this fairly humbly in saying we don't know exactly what he would have done. But we're trying to deal with today's realities is being respectful to the past, respectful to the spirit, uh, if not the exact design, the way he designed it and the way other, um, uh, other landscape architects at the time. So I just uh, wanted to add that little bit of historical reference. Thanks. Thank you. Stephen Douglas. Steve Douglas, uh, 460 Washington Road, former commissioner on the HPC and also uh, part of the uh, engineering committee for the Forest Park Board. But actually I'm speaking tonight um, as a board member of the Lake Forest Preservation Foundation. I've been asked by the president of the foundation and the executive committee to just present this brief statement. The Preservation Foundation supports the idea of the creation of a master plan for Forest Park to guide its rehabilitation now and into the future. We applaud the Lake Forest Garden, Garden Club's generous gift to the community in funding the initial costs associated with contracting with noted landscape architect Stephen Stimson to produce a master plan. Over three years of planning, the proposed plan has evolved and changed, the most significant change being the retention of the ring road. We commend the retention of the ring road and respect and the respect it shows for a park with 150 years of history and the park's connection to two important and significant landscape architects, Almerin Hotchkiss and O.C. Simons. In our position paper of November 2010, we stated, Simons and Hotchkiss's visions are to be the organizing framework for rehabilitating the park's landscape. We stand by that recommendation. Any approved plan should respect the history of the park as it was originally designed and as it has evolved over the past 150 years following the Secretary of Interior standards for the rehabilitation of cultural landscapes. We advocate restoring the original Simons Vistas and we emphasize the importance of the HPC review of auxiliary structures and amenities for certificates of appropriateness. Now the project should proceed, but after the master plan has been approved, the HPC review should continue through design development and the in implementation phase. On behalf of the Preservation Foundation, thank you. Thank you. Um, Steve Brunn, did I say that right? Steve Brunn, B-R-U-H-N? No, Steve went home. Uh, John Henricks. Maybe I'll get, uh, have I got this about the right speed here? Uh, my name is, is uh, actually John Henricks indeed, and uh, I've been a resident for some 37 years. Uh, our home is across the street from the park, so uh, understandably I have a pretty keen interest in it. In fact, it's one of the few houses I think on Lake Road that hasn't been torn down or remodeled in some fashion. Uh, we've made one major change since we've been living there. We, uh, my wife insisted we paint, paint the uh, black shutters blue. <laughs> she likes blue, apparently. <laughs> for some reason, for, the, for me, this, this project has taken on an almost Alice in Wonderland theme. Um, I find it bizarre that anyone would decide that Forest Park, which is ugly, arguably the loveliest park in Lake Forest, is in dire need of improvement. Almost immediately this project was commenced, there were a number of misleading statements issued. Forest Park is the only park in Lake Forest without a master plan. That myth was stated again tonight. Turns out it may be the only park in Lake Forest with, with a master plan. Unless, of course, you consider a topographic map a master plan or a layout of the bathrooms and parking lot a master plan, then you've got a master plan. Then, of course, we were told the bluff was falling and was in dire distress. The ring road had to go. But wait, we, we want to put a big, huge stone bench on the bluff, so maybe the bluff isn't in danger after all. Yet, 
Here's a picture of the bluff taken 100 years ago, and there is no change. Next, we were warned about the danger pedestrians faced walking in the park without footpaths. Forget that there hasn't been a recorded accident in 10 years. Forget about the absolute refusal of at least 80% of the joggers, walkers, or children to use the beautiful footpaths we have right now on Deer Path, Mayflower, or Lake Road. Who is going to use these footpaths to nowhere? I suspect the, crashing, the answer is a crashing no one. I've looked through all 47 pages of the pr proposed changes. I was struck by the indisputable fact that some of the before pictures, that is, as it is today, look far better than the final product. And I refer, refer you to pages 39, 40, and 41 on my document. Have you ever seen more uncomfortable looking or less traditional seating in your life? On page 36, we see a picture of the lovely old style lights as they are right now, and right next to it, the unusual stone bollards that will replace some of them. On page 42, we're treated to a Vietnam-style memorial wall of re remembrance. The historic pedigree of Forest Park is without question, yet we, here we have a renowned contemporary architect propose, proposing changes that will substantially alter it and might indeed endanger its historical status. Mr. Hendricks, are you getting close? I'm getting very close. Okay. Above all, I remind you that this project will cost a ton of money no matter who provides it, and in addition will result, no doubt, in increased maintenance costs. Forgive me, please, for my reluctance to embrace this or any other plan to change it. I've only lived next to it for 37 years. I see the miracle of spring and the fiery colors of fall every year. I see children playing catch in its grassy swaths and old timers sitting arm in arm on the comfortable benches that themselves tell a wonderful story of the families who have loved this park before us. I charge you all take a look at it as it is right now and ask yourself, is it worth millions of dollars to change all this? Thanks very much for your, your Thank you. Comments. Michael Ebner. My name is Michael Ebner. I've lived in Lake Forest at 666 Greenview Place for 38 years. I'm not going to talk about Forest Park this evening. I'm going to talk about my former calling as a professor of history. And I'm going to read a few sentences from Benjamin Franklin. It was the end of the Constitutional Convention, which had labored from May to September of 1787 in Philadelphia. No air conditioning, the shutters closed in order to preserve confidentiality, and it appeared as if the Constitution was going to be rejected by the delegates to the convention rather than sent out to the states for ratification. And so Benjamin Franklin, the oldest member of the Constitutional Convention, delivered his final public statement to the American people at the convention. I'm going to just read a couple of sentences of it. I confess that I do not entirely approve of this Constitution at present. But sir, I am not sure I shall ever approve it. For having lived long, I have experienced many instances of being obliged by better information or fuller consideration to change opinions, even on important subjects, which I once thought right but found to be otherwise. It is therefore that the older I grow, the more apt I am to doubt my own judgment and pay more respect to the judgment of others. I'm going to drop down. By the way, when he gave this speech on September 17th, it was reprinted in newspapers over 125 times within the next month. And that was without the digital age, of course. On the whole, sir, I cannot help expressing a wish that every member of the convention who may still have an objection to it would with me on this occasion doubt a little of his own infallibility. Now, the last time I addressed you, I raised the issue 
again as a historian and a resident of this community, about the great projects in the history of Lake Forest going back to 1857 when Almer and Hotchkiss drew the map. The projects that were the subject of debate and much discussion uh, among those who came before us and some of them in my own lifetime. The water plant, 1896, absolutely essential to public health. This school, Gorton School, its construction, in 1901, Lake Forest High School, 1937, a very emotional issue in this community. Why couldn't we continue to rely on Highland Park High School as we had in the past? The Beach Project, the arrangement with Ragdale, a public-private partnership, and finally, Elwa Farm. This is another opportunity for the city of Lake Forest to distinguish itself. And this is another opportunity to pose consequential questions about the details of this project. And that is your responsibility. And uh, I think that um, the project will benefit from this ongoing process of public deliberation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, did Pat? <laughs> Did Pat just take a phone call, Pat Kemmerer? Okay, um, I'll come back to her. Uh, Leon Falcone? She was just taking a phone call. Huh? Oh, oh. oh. I'm sorry, I, I, um, well, I'll just try and do it. I lost my notes. I, I, I'm the one whose cell phone rang, and, <laughs> and sorry. Um, I'm Pat Hammer. I've lived here for over 45 years. I was on the rec board for over six. We built the building. <laughs> Excuse me. And um, what I'm concerned about are the costs. And I, I've heard all this discussion. And by the way, I want to thank everybody for all the many hours, thought, and perspectives that have been put into this. But I, I have never heard anybody put a dollar sign on anything except the 100000 that the city has, which I think might pay for a, a consultant. And so I'm just thinking, how many millions are involved? Because you're building roads, you're building pathways, you're doing engineering, you're putting in stone. And I heard the word monolithic, which I agree with. And so at any rate, I'm just thinking, how, what's, the, what's the final, I mean, do you have anything even close? Because the road costs so much per square foot, I think, or linear foot. So you must have some idea of that. You certainly know how much gravel and limestone costs and how much your cost for in, uh, digging it. The engineering is, uh, 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 that's very, very important the water runoff, all these things are major, major project. And they don't even come close to what was uh, well, the cost of Market Square, for instance, which was a lovely project. But I'm just thinking, people don't want their uh, real estate taxes to go up. I'm sure you're not going to go ahead with anything, any contracts, anything, until you have funding in place. But who knows how much it's going to cost? I think somebody should be putting a uh, price tag on some of these things before you make any decisions because I can't understand how you can make decisions unless you know how much it's going to cost. I, I frankly never do very much without knowing how much it's going to cost first. And, and so I think that's a rather important part of this whole process. I think you should be putting um, costs on these projects and then I think you'd have a better idea of what you want to go ahead and do. So that's what I have to say. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Leon Falcone. Good evening chairman and members of chairpersons, pardon me, and members of the board. 
My name's Leon Falcone, and I lately lived at 930 Lake Road. And as I drive around Lake Forest, I see and congratulate all the Lake Forest Preservation Foundation recipients for their various awards. At the same time, I regret that the Foundation hasn't seen fit to award Forest Park one of them. It, it surely must fit the criteria to deserve one. As a co-chair of Friends of Forest Park in 2011, we published a list of recommendations for Forest Park. And part of it, in brief, was one, that the Forest Park Board follow the basic guidelines of the Historical Preservation Commission, with the exception of leaving in the central parking for practical purposes. That there still exists a plan by the original developer. That the O.C. Simons plan be used as a guideline by a preservation landscape architect as a consultant, that the bluff be reseeded with indigenous plantings, that the stone tiers would be more appropriate done at the beach, that the stairs be rehabilitated in accordance with the East Lake Forest, um, East Lake Forest preservation rules and regulations, that the central parking be reconnected to the ring road, that the all that it all be done according to lead and that committees be established to oversee Forest Park and all the other parks and that the community be more involved. It is unfortunate that only one or two of these requests have been proposed by the Forest Park Project Board. I respectfully ask that this not be the last public meeting, that there be more involvement in the decision-making process by all of the residents of Lake Forest. After all, it is a public park and we should all be entitled to our opinion and vote in this historic park, which we thought was, protect was protected by the East Lake Forest Historic District. May I make a recommendation to the Historic Preservation Commission and the Parks and Rec that we revisit the minutes of the City Council meeting almost two years ago to the day and that the combined recommendations of Mayor Cowie and the City Manager Kylie be that due diligence continue as it relates to the Forest Park plan and that, we, and that ultimately the decision of the conceptual final plan be approved by the Lake Forest Historic Preservation Commission. Mr Kylie's reasoning at the time was that Lake Forest was inundated with multiple challenges specific to Lake Forest that minimalised their focus on the Forest Park master plan. This is Lake Forest's only traditional historic park. O.C. Simon said that if a park has been properly designed, then it should never really need redesigning. Next year, it would be lovely to see a preservation foundation sign in the front of the park. And one other statement. In all of this discussion, is there really anything wrong with walking on the grass or the road? Thank you. Thank you. Um, Judy Bogus, please. I just have a couple of comments to make about the appropriateness of stone that I thought maybe would help some of you as you make your decisions. Granite is certainly the material of choice throughout much of the Chicagoland area in the early 20th century because it's a native material in this area, relatively inconspicuous in the landscape, and it requires little maintenance. Most historical parks have been re rehabilitated have kept this in mind, whether O.C. Simons, Jens Jensen, or Frederick Law Olmsted. Many of you can go on and drive through uh, beautiful Jackson Park, which has been done, and see some of the way stone has been used. And I think it would help you probably in your understanding of choice. Uh, as a matter of fact, I wish there was enough money to use granite in some of the other city parks in Lake Forest. It would be nice to have that tradition continued. Uh, I think I've spoken briefly on disability situations, but I think it might be appropriate here just as you discuss uh, how to handle handicap situations here. I think I'm somewhat qualified to speak about disability since I had a, had a disabled husband for 25 years. The last seven years he was in a wheelchair. I think it's important to understand when someone is disabled that singularly the most important thing anyone can do for that person is to help them get out, move around, be stimulated. Sitting in a car and never moving is probably one of the saddest types of support. 
Here we are lucky to have a beautiful park in which we encourage exactly that. Help someone out of a car, either to walk or be pushed so they can see all the different views. See trees up close, touch a plant, smell the roses, as one might say. And as you've been to the Botanic Garden, I want you to remember what those handicap areas are all about. They are interactive. They encourage the handicap to be a participant in this garden. They are not confined in cars. Thank you. Thank you. Basil Fatclone, please. Good evening, ev <coughs> Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me all right? My name is Basil Falcone, 45 years a resident, resident of Lake Forest. <clears throat> My comments will just be rather brief. Three points. Number one, as it relates to the comments that were made by Ms. Gail Hodges, as well as Mr. Ebner, that specifically this project of Forest Park is a rehabilitative plan and not a restoration plan. <coughs> I must take exception to that, and I think a lot of people as well should take ex exception to that because it's both, both rehabilitative as well as restoration, and both should be addressed by the Historic Preservation Commission as it relates to the specific ordinances and compliances, and I have a copy here of 37 points Verbatim, historic, the City of Lake Forest Historic Preservation Commission as it relates to historic preservation ordinances and standards. A section both on restoration and a section as well on rehabilitation. We ask that you address these issues in your final decision making of this particular plan. I think we're making strides, no question about it. There are issues that we can all look at as it relates to for example, amenities being contemporized as it relates to ones that be uh, very addressed to a period of time that should remain. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Prue Beidler. Well, I can say I'll be brief and then I won't, but, but I know I've got the three minutes and you'll make me stop when I have to. Um, so uh, when I married my husband, Frank Beidler, who is here tonight, and thank you for being here tonight. I think I might not have tipped him off to, to how long we might be here. Um, I, we got married um, almost 44 years ago now. He had been a resident. He was in his family, the third generation in Lake Forest, and we now have uh, grandchildren who live in Lake Forest. So we have five generations of our family, not only who live in Lake Forest, but actually five generations, all of whom call Forest Park our neighborhood park. All of us live, um, uh, Frank grew up on Walden Road. His, uh, his father and grandmother bought our house on Stonegate Road. Our children, uh, which is where they grew up, and our son and his wife have a house on Mayflower. So all of us have had that as our essentially our neighborhood park now for five generations. We use the park. We use it actively. Um, uh, Frank and I actually ride a tandem bike, and uh, we very often, in fact, almost always start our bike rides, which go around a, a range of places, but we almost always start them in Forest Park. And it's a beautiful place to start. We, we have better views of the lake uh, in, in uh, the cooler weather. Uh, of, the, of the late fall and winter and spring than we do in the summer, and I think that's going to change for sure. Um, we certainly think the park needs improvement. And on the one matter of the safety, I would be very clear with you that we do not feel safe on the ring road on our tandem bike. And the reason we don't feel safe is that we have been hit, almost hit, and we have not been hit. We've been nearly hit a couple of times. Now, I am on the tandem. I'm what's called the stoker. And Frank is the captain, and Frank is, you know, scanning the horizon, and I'm basically yelling from behind. I know this is an interesting concept. But, but and a couple of times, I have actually yelled from behind, watch out! And, 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 uh, and, 
it, it's, it's a beautiful place to be. It is not a safe place to be. And I say the same thing because I take my grandchildren there, and this is the place I like to take my grandchildren and buggies and explain why we are called Lake Forest, and the two, the two come together there. And, and uh, I, 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 I honestly think that path is going to be fantastic for those of us who use buggies. I, I, you know, whether our tandem bike will be there, we'll at least have the option to be there. I gather that bikes will be allowed in both the, both the road and the path. Um, but for me to be able to take grandchildren in a place safely with a view of the lake is going to be incredibly important. And finally, because I haven't heard that beep yet, um, as the former co-president of the Market Square Project, I would like to say one of the things this town is we're, we, we take we take conversation about projects incredibly seriously, as a number of people have pointed out. It was certainly an important part of our processing at Market Square. It's been an important part of the processing here. What's happening with the Forest Park Project Board and the work it's doing is extraordinary. I honor the volunteers both at the city level, but, but make no mistake, the hours that have gone into the work here, deliberative, thoughtful, reflective, taking history seriously, taking current needs seriously. I cannot imagine a better process than the one that we're experiencing here tonight. Thank you. For Arthur Miller. Is Art here? There he is. Arthur Miller, 169 Wildwood Road. A uh, 40-year resident, that's two years more than Michael Ebner, my <laughs> colleague. Uh, just to keep that clear. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would like to comment, uh, I have a brief statement that I'm going to read and then I'm going to share, pass around for you. But I wanted to first comment based on some of the things I've heard tonight. Um, and from my point of view of being at the college and being trained in some of these things, like Michael is, um, that what we're talking about when we talk about the legal standards in our statute, in the federal statutes um, is basically codifying what are the classic principles that came from ancient times to in the Renaissance and finally came over here with the City Beautiful Movement a uh, hundred years ago. Um, they include hierarchy of form, hierarchy of materials, hierarchy of scale, and um, all those things, and then proportion, how things fit together, and especially the, the composition goes in to take the, um, the hierarchy mater of materials and the proportions and make them work together all together. Um, I think we need to realize that we are not talking about something that's just a local ordinance, just something that's a law. It's actually something that's based on long practice. Um, and I think that the plan is reflecting that. Secondly, um, when we talk about preservation versus um, rehabilitation, these are ideas rooted in 19th century theory by Ville Le Duc in France, uh, John Ruskin in England um, in his um, um, Gothic article on Gothic architecture and the, uh, the, the architecture of memory. Uh, in the seven lamps of architecture. There's so many copies of that in Lake Forest, in Old Lake Forest. We've farmed them out when they came in, in the 80s. Uh, DePaul has a huge set from Lake Forest. So many of them came off, the, this is common language here at that time. So everybody knew these rules and we're relearning them today. So with th that background, here is my brief statement. The recently revised and shared plan for Forest Park has improved as its details developed, as concerns were addressed, and as new suggestions and information came to bear. Though it does not meet all of my wishes, mostly about the need for cars on a two-block narrow overlook park, it honors tradition or long historic precedent which has been embraced by the public. This is a subtle sensitive plan that accommodates a range of ecological and design needs while preserving the essential character of the park, its succession of woodland and open spaces along the bluff's edge, a rhythm. The seating, to, uh, uh, the seating is understated and the materials reflect as well the long established local materials precedent since the 1887 Presbyterian Church which was built of this limestone between the park and the train station. The, once again, Elmer and Hotchkiss's 1857 original vision for this overlook at its greatest table, plan, table land viewpoint, uh, the center of his plan, 
um, is being honored, and there's no break uh, there. And O.C. Simon's similarly quiet and respectful addressing of that. These will be restored and honored. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Christine Mulder. Hello, I'm uh, Christine Mulder. I live at 535 Deer Path, and I think I'm definitely worn down by all this, pro by all this, this evening. Um, I do want to thank everyone on the committees for, there have been a lot of really good improvements since the last time I saw the plan, but I, I have a question. I, I don't understand, are we trying to bring the park you know, back from neglect, or are we trying to make it a, a destination? It, it seems with all the paths and all the stone, and I disagree. I think it is a truly elegant park. I love the park. It's, it's a feeling that the park has. And I think with the changing of the paths and the stone, and I just feel it changes the character of the park. That's all I have to say. Thank you. John Mariani. My name's John Mariani. I'm a landscape architect, Mariani Landscape. Um, some of you might know me as the last baby born at Lake Forest Hospital, 1955. Was anybody there? <laughs> okay, maybe not. <laughs> but So anyway, I think most people that live here and have lived here for a while n uh, understand that we've been in the community a long time. We're five generations of, of landscape designers and uh, contractors and have done a lot of work in Lake Forest, including Market Square. And um, of course, I played in in the park for years and years and years. And my grandfather, John Fiore, would bring us there um, for Rotary Club. We'd have our parties there, so we used it a lot as kids, and uh, still use it a little bit, but not as much as I used to. But uh, uh, I think before we do anything with this park, the first dime we spend is going to have to be for a new PA system right here. <laughs> Right? Okay, we need to do that first. And then we'll move on to budgeting the park. But I think... That's right. I'll have Brenda Dick call you in the morning. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, so anyway, all I can say is I'm honored to have been invited to be on the Landscape and Horticulture Committee. Um, there's some great talent in all these committees here. I mean, this is the best group of people I've ever seen pulled together to create something like this. Um, we've, uh, we contract, we, we install a lot of work for other landscape designers, and I have to honestly say that I've never seen a more comprehensive plan that really works and respects the people of Lake Forest, how they use this site, and um, respects O.C. Simons and his design philosophy. And in fact, I'd like to read what that philosophy is because I don't think that's been mentioned yet. Uh, but the basic definition of the prairie style movement, which he was at the beginning of, uh, means, uh, uh, it means that uh, uh, you're going to have uh, open character in, the, in these designs, horizontal expanses, interaction of sky and water, broad, expansive, as well as focused long views, layered limestone imitating natural rock outcroppings or the native glacial ridges of the Midwest region, stone walls, that word stone's been used a lot, there's a reason for it, flagstone is our local stone. So we're being more green by using it because we're not traveling across the country to get it. It's right here. All our soils are developed from limestone. Flagstone Pass overlooks in council rings. Now, we don't necessarily have to have a council ring. That's more Jens Jensen. But I think we're headed in the right direction. We use this to mold this design. And uh, I just think that Stephen has done a fantastic job, and I commend him. One other point, if I could make it. We are doing a restoration here, in a sense. And that's the native lands that we have around the park. 
It's not just about us, it's also about nature and the wildlife that lives and depends on this park on both ends and including the bluff. We're restoring that. You cannot just let it go because the insp invasive species will take over and it'll be the end of it. And it's approaching that now. So we're going to restore that, okay? And I think we'll be that much farther ahead in the process. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Rami Lopat. Hi, my name is Rami Lopat, 410 East Woodland Road. Here are some reasons that this plan is not ready to be approved by the City Council in May. First, the statement of goals on page four is two years out of date. A different set is on the project board's website. Yet another goal that Forest Park is a cultural landscape was stated by the project board in 2012. I ask that your boards create one set to recommend to the City Council. Second, planning outcomes should be based on correct assumptions. On page 14, sorry John, a uh, reference to the prairie style of landscape design should be removed. Simon's biographer says that he rejected the prairie style name and motive, finding more inspiration in ravines and forests. The plan should not say, th should not say that we honor the work of O.C. Simons and then include illustrations of prairie grasses, limbed up trees, needless paths, and stone amenities. Simons didn't even want stone monuments in his cemeteries. The plan also needs to describe philo the philosophies of Simons and of Mr. Stimson as well. Number four, uh, we can't tell if this plan solves drainage issues. In 80 pages of plan, there are just three paragraphs and one vague diagram devoted to how drainage will work. We need more information. Here's a concern that came up tonight. If you plow that path, you have to put that snow someplace. It's going to go between the path and the bluff, and you're going to have drainage problems on the, on the path and erosion problems on the bluff. Number five, improved and consistent signage was not a stated goal, but should be. Look at page 52, and then look at page 53. The sign announcing Forest Park is gone. No sign at all is there. If signage standards were included, then the park staff could implement better ideas immediately. Six, this plan doesn't meet the goal of honoring community sentiment. Mr. Stimson said that he was trying to avoid a Victorian knee-jerk effect when he chose stone seats instead of custom park benches like at the beach. Victorian has served our city well. We like it. Let's keep it. Seven, this plan does not promote respect for the land, otherwise stated as let's prevent further erosion. The city staff report says that engineers will evaluate the new bluff path's er impact on erosion later, after this master plan is approved. I say we don't have to wait. Why? Because in Mar on, March 5th on March 5th, 2010, in a memo, the city engineers stated, any type of development proposed to be located within the bluff setback area is discouraged or prohibited since it can hasten the instability of the slope. The path is in the bluff setback area. End of story. Eight, does the plan improve pedestrian safety? First of all, city staff wrote that there is no problem. I'll be done in a sec. But beyond that, the elements in this plan should be evaluated to see if they make pedestrian safety worse. I have three examples, here's one. The proposed bluff path ends right between the ring road and the North Beach access road, one of the most worrisome intersections in town. The path actually creates a safety hazard. Nine, restoration plans for the bluff and ravines are missing and should be included now. 10, the public is the only group that has not been involved in this plan and it needs time to participate in open planning meetings and propose suggestions. When can we do this? Last, this plan does not need to be approved now because there is no true hurry. The, plan, the public's biggest problem with Forest Park is that it's embarrassing to drive into it and see an enormous gaping pothole as your first impression. We think to ourselves, this is like forest? This is how we maintain things? Sadly, the staff report you got tonight says, due to the low volume of vol vehicles using this road, the pavement is not <laughs> scheduled to be replaced in the current five-year resurfacing cycle. That means the road will not be resurfaced until after 2017. 
sounds like we have plenty of time for discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Alice Goltra. Hello, um, I'm Alice Goltra. I live on Wincia Road. Um, I want to thank everybody. I think this process has gone on longer than any other process in history, and you've stuck with it. And I think the give and take has sometimes not been easy, but you're all to be congratulated for participating in a discussion, but maybe it should end. I think um, one of the things that nobody's talking about is the value of a master plan. In the years in the future have been mentioned, but you have to realize the staff comes and goes. We don't have a city architect. Um, I think that when the, the decisions are made about what you want the park to look like, what plants you want in it, how it should be surfaced, you need a master plan to document your decisions, and the city should respect that plan and abide by it forever. This has been a big discussion. You're making important decisions. You need a document that the city will live with. And please try to produce one. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Gail Hodges? You'll pass? OK. Um, Sandy Ganon? I'm Sandy Ganon. I live at 650 Northmore Road. Boy, does it feel good to stand up. Uh, if this were an untouched site, my comments on the proposed plan would probably be very different, but it's not. It's been either blessed or encumbered, depending on your perspective, with having notable designers work on it and having some very unique topography. I'll give you a couple of comments, just overview on the plan, and then some specifics on some of the major elements. In the beginning, in the vision and goals section, there is no mention of cultural landscape and what that might entail. And there's no use of the word historic. I find that distressing. In the regional context area, there's no real description of the unique earthern bluffs and ravines between Winnetka and North Chicago. I think there's only one other site in this country that has that unique topography. And on the very last page references, there's an, uh, listed an article by Art Miller and two articles and an introduction by Robert Greasy. No mention of Simon's own book, Landscape Gardening, or the 211. 2011 autobiography by Barbara Geiger, low-key genius. That's pretty amazing. For the ring road, it's not 23 feet currently, it's 20. I've measured it with a tape measure. If you don't believe me, don't scale it off a plan, do the same. It's 20 feet along the bluff and in the northern section going out to Lake Road. 16 feet where it's the extension from Spring Lane. I think it should remain at 20 feet for easy passing of cars going by people who were stopped on the ring road. Uh, people don't pull nicely to the curb. You need that buffer. Um, do some people watching. That's what happens. I think some perpendicular parking should remain at the head of the Belvedere. 20 spaces, now 10 or 12, I think that would be fine. A couple of handicapped spaces in there. That makes sense, should be perpendicular. That's pretty easy to screen. The thought er earlier presentation about a pull off by the Prime Vista. You're looking at cars in a side view at the Prime Vista, well, that's sort of conflicting design goals. I don't think that makes any sense there. I think there should be no parking on the inside of the ring road anywhere at any time. That negates use of the park, the whole table land. How about some options? We don't get options in any of these elements, 
How about shuttle buses parking at the railroad station or possibly at the college? There's some things to be explored that don't negate use of that tableland during peak periods. I've got a lot here. I will send you some written comments, but I think the first thing that everybody should keep in mind is first, do no harm. That's what's Thank proposed you. here would be irreparable damage to this very unique site. Thank you. Thank you. Alice, uh, Mol Alice Moult Neely. Al okay. Uh, Winnie Crawford. My name is Winnie Crawford. My husband Bob and I live at 676 Lake Road, located at the corner of Spring and Lake Road. Our home looks directly into Forest Park. As a point of reference, my father-in-law was Commissioner of Recreation, a Parks and Recreation <coughs> for 29 years for the city of Philadelphia. He oversaw all the city parks, many of which were small and historic, and he continually shared his respective uh, respected knowledge with us. With this background, we feel we garnered a unique respect for what we are dealing with here at Forest Park. Preservation is important to us, and we feel this plan embodies and preserves its heritage. We have spent much time looking over the revived set of plans for Forest Park and are happy to say that we would be most, that we are most impressed. We would be more than happy to see the enhancements proposed for this beautiful park. Yes, the park in front of our house is lovely, but it is also tired and in need of some tender loving care. We are not members of the Garden Club or any of the other groups involved with this issue, but are concerned residents who value the historic nature of the park and welcome the opportunity to see this special place come alive once again. As with the home, there comes a time when one needs to spruce it up for any number of reasons. That is what we would like to see happen here with this particular park. And as a side, and as an additional note, um, Bob and I use the park a lot. We love to, nature, we love to be outside. Um, about a year ago, I was nearly hit by a car. So it is, I didn't, but it came very close. Thank you. Thank you. Julie Preeb. <laughs> I'm Julie, um, Mrs. Frank Prebe Jr., 710 North Mayflower. And I wanted to just say that uh, I have lived one block from the park for, uh, since 1955. That's 57 years ago. And I walked my dogs, my children, and my grandchildren there ever since and I'm very very loving of the park um, it's a time has taken a, a toll on this beloved space and it's time to update it and I feel that we have a plan here that is really a good plan it's been gone over many times you've done a good job all of you and I think that it's time to now go on and get it done and so thank you very much thank you uh, Ginny Moore uh, Ginny Moore left okay well last but certainly not least Tom O'Neill Uh, hello, uh, my name is Tom O'Neill. I live at 766 Highview Terrace. Um, I was raised here since I was two. My wife Molly has was raised here since she was 10. Uh, and we are now raising our two children here, ages five and 10 months. And I will say that the, uh, although we live very close to South Park and we use it a lot, we would love to use Forest Park because it doesn't have the jungle gym the structured soccer games, 
that are much, very much noisy to enjoy the park. And so to be able to use Forest Park, it's not safe enough for our children. Maybe as we keep our daughter in a stroller, yes, but our five-year-old running or riding his bike, he darts out too fast, you will not be able to see him and he could get hit. Now, John Henrik says, no one's been hit in 10 years. Well, I don't want my son to be the first one since. Um, the second part I want to bring up is just the health factor of all this. People are complaining about having to walk. Get off your ass. <laughs> I mean, seriously. We have a major obesity problem in this country, people. Let's start walking, maybe jogging a little. You know, come on, let's move a little. The third thing I want to mention, and I'll, and I'll stop, um, all kidding aside, is you know what? If, if the final decision that nothing's going to happen, you know what? You just say, you know what, we're just not going to do this project, then I'm going to propose that we make Forest Park used like every other park in Lake Forest. Let's put up the soccer nets. Let's make a jungle gym. Let's have structured games, a softball you know, field. Let's be great. Let's put it to use in the way that every other park is used. Otherwise, let's change it so it can be used in a proper way that a park should be used. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I now will direct my comments to the two uh, chairmen. That concludes the public comment this evening. The two boards have basically three options. You can leave public comment open, you can close both oral and written comment, or you can close oral but leave open written. So I give those three options to you as to how you want to proceed. Uh, well actually, just why don't we that? close, decide how we're going to close comments and then okay. we're going to open it back up to the board. Okay, um, based on um, the information gained this evening and the public comment heard and the fact that our board meeting is only, um, our next board meeting is only four days away, um, it is the part of the board's decision to not allow um, comments anymore um, or oral comments at our next meeting. We will take written comments if you would like to do that. And our next meeting is Tuesday, May 8th. Two opens here and one close. I, I've heard enough. I, you'll hear comments either side forever. We're going to leave public testimony open, Bob. Okay. Just so everybody could hear, the HPC is leaving public testimony open and the Park and Rec Board is closing public testimony. Any final comments? And I'll uh, allow the two chairmen to make final closing comments. Um, it is quite clear tonight as well over, as over the past four years that Forest Park is indeed a very special park in our community. It is also evident that the park is in need of a master plan to guide the necessary restoration that needs to occur now and to aid in the future decisions affecting the park. The Parks and Recreation Board greatly appreciates all of the feedback and participation over the past four years that has led to the final master plan discussed this evening. It is our belief that the proposed plan reflects a proper balance between preserving the historical ring road and aesthetics while making sure it meets the recreational needs of our community. We strongly believe that first and foremost, it is our charge to ensure that this park is designed to maximize the passive recreation benefits this unique property has to offer and that it functions as a recreational property to serve residents from all four wards of the community. This plan celebrates the unique topography of this site, the bluff, the lake views, the woodland, the lawns, the ravines, while providing for essential elements to support use, including proper parking and connective state pedestrian pathways. We are very pleased with how this plan has continued to evolve over the past four years and must thank the Forest Park Project Board, who are residents just like all of us, and Stephen Simpson, Stimson, for their efforts to revise the plan to meet our ever-changing realities and dreams for this special park. We um, again thank everyone for their attendance tonight and look forward to seeing you Tuesday, May.
going to give it time. No, I think it gets there. It just, I just talked too fast. Um, I didn't write a similar statement for you. Uh, we're hoping that we continue to see progress. You know, we've, we've seen some progress since the last time we've seen this plan, both in terms of the text of the master plan, which is, which is most helpful, uh, and in terms of at least some movement on the, the amenities, which I think is in positive direction. Um, we think we've made consistent points with you this evening, maybe even more direct so than the last time. And, um, you know, we take this job very seriously, and we're, we're not, you know, this isn't our personal opinion. This is graded um, against what we think is the right way to grade this as, as a historic preservation board. So um, we left it open because we're hoping that we actually see some continued progress, and I think that that would be helpful, but um, that's speaking just as the chairman. So anyway, good night. Thanks for everybody's uh, uh, input and, uh, you know, just really trying to make this as productive for everyone as possible. You can see there's plenty of divisive opinion on this, and uh, we, love, we love a solution that f without compromising, you know, the principle and without compromising the, uh, the solution uh, gets to, you know, gets to answer in the best way the problem. So thanks. Thanks, everyone, for coming this evening. Reminder, May 8th, Park and Rec Board. May 16th is the HPC.